So John made some contacts, and we are so glad that uh, Matt accepted the invitation to come to our home turf, our home stadium. <laughs> All the way from Austin, Texas, we thank him for being here. And then Than Christopoulos, who came all the way from Madison, Wisconsin, who is a Christian apologist and obviously will be sharing uh, the point of view of the resurrection that I hold to. And so we are thankful you all came tonight. Let me give you some very important information. Where's the bathroom? That's important, right? Whether you're a Christian or an atheist, that's very important. And so the bathroom is located on each wing. So there's a men's, a men's, a men's restroom that way. There's one this way as well. We're glad you're here. It is Good Friday. And so I am going to open in a prayer. And uh, I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus because I'm the pastor and this is my home stadium and I do what I want here, all right? <laughs> so thank you for coming. So Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this opportunity to have this debate. And God, I ask that you bless each person here. God, we are all seekers of truth and we want truth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and enjoy the debate. All right, just a couple of things. So if you did not get a paper, I'm going to give you just a moment. Right literally in the center as you walk out those doors, there are papers that they are dictating what is going to happen in the debate format. If you want to grab one of those, you're more than welcome to do so. My name is Jonathan Gary, uh, Pastor John. I'm the youth pastor here, as Pastor already said. This is going to be the structure of the debate so everyone can understand. We are going to have 25-minute opening statements, starting with Than Christopoulos with the affirmative of the position on the resurrection followed by Matt Dillahunty giving a 25-minute opening statement. Then we will go into 10-minute rebuttals, starting with Than and then going with Matt. We will have a 10-minute intermission because uh, we want to give you a little bit of a break from hearing all of the talking. And then we are going to go into cross-examination, 10 minutes for Matt, 10 minutes for Than. During the cross-examination, what will happen is both of the debaters will have the ability to reclaim their time, which basically means whenever one is giving an answer, once they have given an adequate answer, the other debater can reclaim their time so that they can continue asking questions during the cross-examination. Then we will go into five-minute closings and then a 20-minute Q&A. The Q&A is going to work in this way. The screens up here are going to pop up a QR code. They're going to pop up a QR code one during the intermission during the 10 minutes and two at the end of the closing statement given by Than Christopoulos in which case you can scan the QR code. It's going to take you to a website to where you can ask your question. And you may say, listen, I don't know what to ask. I don't have a question. Well, guess what? You can still scan the QR code and you can vote on questions that have been asked. We will not have an open microphone tonight. It will be entirely through the QR code system. And then I will receive the system on my tablet and be able to uh, sort through the questions. Here's the only thing I ask during the intermission when you ask your questions, if you have a question that is directed toward Than, I want you to put T dash and then your question. If you have a question that is directed toward Matt, I want you to put M dash and then your question. If you have a question that is directed toward both, I want you to put B dash and then your question. Does everyone understand? Say yep. All right, fantastic. Well, with that being said, the topic of tonight's debate is going to be the resurrection is a historical event. Than will argue that the resurrection is more probable compared to its competing hypotheses, and Matt will be holding the opposing view. The conduct that is expected from the audience, we would like to ask you to hold applause until after each uh, debater has given their presentation. Tomatoes, both verbal and physical, will not be tolerated. We do have security in case that happens, so please control yourselves. No interruptions. Thank you very much. So tonight, Than Christopoulos is a Christian apologist and founder of Exploring Reality Ministries. He is a man I am proud to call my very good friend, and he has a TikTok of a couple thousand followers if you want to follow him on there. Matt Dillahunty is a former Southern Baptist. He's a magician, a skeptic, known for the call-in show The Atheist Experience and the former president of the Atheist Community of Austin. With all the preliminaries done, please welcome Than Christopoulos for his opening statement, and let's get started. Check, okay. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Am I just gonna start talking and you'll start the timer? How's this yes. Going? Okay, cool. Good evening, everybody. My name is Stan Christopoulos. I'm the founder of Exploring Reality. I wanna start by thanking Crossman Church. I'm really humbled to be 
on this stage. And I'm ex exceptionally humbled to be sharing the stage with Matt Dillahunty, somebody who's had tons of experience in these areas and very respected. Uh, just a heads up, there's going to be a lot of times where I'm going to reference things on a screen, but due to time constraints, I won't be reading them in full. There's so much to go over, so the slides are going to do some extra work for me. Tonight's debate is about the resurrection of Jesus, and before I get into that, I need to hit on some preliminaries that will help us put everything together. After that, I'm going to present four main points. The first and main point, the probability that the resurrection happened is higher than the probability of its competing theories. That will be argued in, three, in light of three other main points. The prior probability of the resurrection is not too low to overcome with a reasonable amount of evidence. Point three, the New Testament is historically reliable and contains what the eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus originally said. And then lastly, the combination of the evidence from the testimony of the eyewitnesses and the other historical considerations favors the resurrection. So anytime we want to know if an event happened or not, we need to ask three main questions. What is the prior probability of, of the event in question? That's the probability of the event given our background knowledge. Next, we need to ask, what are the odds of the evidence we would have if the event did occur? Then lastly, what, are, what is the probability of the evidence we have if the event did not occur? Here's the basic idea. Prior probabilities are important because they tell us how strong the evidential case needs to be. If the prior probability is low, then we need a high strength of evidence. If the prior is high, we only need a little bit of evidence. The last two questions help us evaluate the strength of the evidence through something called the likelihood ratio, and that's something I'll cover a little bit later. So we have to tackle a fundamental question here. What is evidence? Um, a short summary of the positive relevance definition of evidence is that a data point is evidence for a hypothesis if it makes that hypothesis more probable. Here's an example of how this works. Imagine you're walking in the woods and you see a rusty, broken down cabin. Now ask yourself, are there people staying there or not? The prior probability that people are staying there might seem low because people tend to not sit in rusty, broken down cabins. But as you get closer, you do see lights on, smoke coming out of the chimney, shoes, and other signs of occupation. While you don't see people, the lights, smoke, and shoes are all data points that are much more likely on the condition people are staying in the cabin than not. To be clear, this principle isn't something I've made up. This is a consensus amongst philosophers of science and evidence. Now, what would be evidence for a miracle? There's a lot of different things we can point to, but the main thing I want to focus on today is testimony. For anyone skeptical of this, consider that there are people that specialize in epistemology, the study of knowledge, and we have a subset of that study called the epistemology of testimony. The philosophers who focus on this are not rejecting testimony as evidence. In fact, as Jennifer Lackey says, testimony is an ineliminable epistemic source. Were we to refrain from accepting the testimony of others, our lives would be impoverished in startling and debilitating ways. So if testimony is valuable evidence in our everyday lives, it can therefore be evidence for whether or not a miracle happened. Now I want to shift to another focus, disconfirming competing hypotheses. If a certain data point is unexpected if a miracle did occur, it helps us to actually confirm a miracle, and this is where that likelihood ratio comes into play. Now, this ratio is the answers to our last two questions. What are the odds of the evidence if the, if the event occurred? And what are the odds of the evidence if the event did not occur? The output of this ratio tells us how strongly the evidence supports one hypothesis over another. This is why we ask those questions, and this is why a mixture of evidence for the miracle and against the competing theories is important. This, again, not something I made up. It's common practice in multiple academic disciplines to focus on this likelihood ratio, whether it's science or history. Here's an example of how this works in a non-miracle case. Let's go back to our cabin example. All we're saying is that the odds of the evidence, that is the smoke, the lights, the shoes, being there if people are staying in the cabin is very high, while the odds of those things being present if nobody was staying in the cabin is very low, so it's more probable that, the, that people are staying in the cabin. Now I want to move on to some definitions. Laws in nature are simply descriptions that tell us how nature behaves when it's left to itself. A miracle, by contrast, is an event that would not have occurred if nature was left to itself. They're clearly detectable deviations from the laws in nature produced by a divine agent that certifies a religious claim. Now, this is important because many times skeptics like to use the uniformity of the laws in nature as evidence against miracle accounts. Someone might say, dead men stay dead, therefore the resurrection probably didn't happen. The proponents of this sort of argument find their roots in David Hume, an 18th century Scottish philosopher. There have been numerous responses to Hume by even agnostics like John Earman. 
And here's one of the many issues with Hume's argument. This is just a mathematical disproof of Hume's point. Again, no religious nonsense. This is just straight up math. Here's what the math means. The fact that our ordinary experience tells us dead men stay dead cannot be a significant piece of evidence against the resurrection because miracles could not function as a sign without the backdrop of a stable natural order. The laws in nature functioning as they usually do in most cases is not surprising on the miracle hypothesis, so this typical objection won't work. With all that out of the way, let's now begin contention two. What is the prior probability of the resurrection of Jesus? Dead men do stay dead, so why would Jesus be unique? Before I answer this, I want to stress that even if I grant a low prior for the resurrection, it doesn't mean the resurrection isn't more probable. My case does not hinge on this because we still have to evaluate the evidence itself. As you'll see, we have a lot of evidence and the force of the evidence we have is very strong. For example, Tim and Leah McGrew, when talking of the priors, say the evidence is strong enough that the skeptic would have to argue that the prior probability of the resurrection would have to be as low as 10 to the negative 43rd power in order to say the evidence can't overcome the prior. That would be 43 zeros. And if someone wants to argue the prior probability is that low, they better have a good reason why. That being said, there are also good reasons to think the prior probability of the resurrection isn't too low. The prior probability of the resurrection will be a conjunction of two things, the probability that God exists and the probability that God would want to raise Jesus. Richard Swinburne, professor of philosophy at Oxford, has put forth a strong case that if God exists, he would perform a miracle like the resurrection of Jesus. And he does this in three steps. Here's the basic idea. If God exists, he is perfect. If he's perfect, he will pursue the best kinds of actions. Swinburne then lays out why an incarnation would be a best kind of action. And broadly speaking, he gives three reasons. One reason would be to provide atonement for humanity's wrongdoing. Given the finitude of humanity, we're subject to moral failure and death. Because of this, we need a way to make amends, but given our finitude, we lack the ability to do this. God being a perfect being would then become incarnate to perfectly defeat sin and death on our behalf. And this would be God incarnate's way of which he would liberate and heal us from the power of sin and death itself. I want to give the second reason through a story. In my early 20s, I was a firefighter, and to this day I share bonds with some people from those days that will never be matched by others. The reason why is because we shared our experiences of witnessing some horrible things and sometimes nearly losing our lives. This deep bond born of solidarity is another reason why God would choose to become incarnate, to share that solidarity of humanity with us. And finally, we need better information about how to lead good lives and encouragement to do so. This is another reason why God would become incarnate, is to provide a moral exemplar by showing us how to live. After that, Swinburne argues that we would expect that God incarnate's life would include some of the following features because they would be the best possible kinds of actions. This list includes, but is not limited to, telling people that he is God incarnate and that he will provide atonement, founding a community to spread and pass on this news to all cultures, that he would most likely authenticate his claims by some kind of miracle, something that would make it obvious that his claims were true and that his promise of liberation from sin and death would not hold us. And what better way, by the way, to do that by conquering death itself? Another expectation to consider is that the incarnation of God would represent in the pinnacle of human history and fundamentally alter the course of humanity in reshaping its trajectory, which, by the way, secular historian Tom Holland has argued Jesus has done. And lastly, he argues that Jesus is the only candidate that fulfills these expectations, putting Jesus in a unique category. So this isn't just some random guy. This is a man whose life has changed the world in ways that we all take for granted. So while I find the evidence supportive of God's existence, let's in the spirit of modesty consider our neutral stance on that topic. To be explicit, I'm using the existence of God conditionally here. So even if there's a modest likelihood that if God exists, he would choose to become incarnate for the reasons outlined and subsequently validate this through a significant miracle like a resurrection, then the prior probability of Jesus' resurrection wouldn't be so low that it couldn't be reasonably supported by evidence, especially when considering Jesus' unparalleled fulfillment of our expectations. So if one wants to object to the resurrection in light of prior probabilities, they would have to both rebut the reasons for the prior not being too low and give an argument for why the prior is too low for the evidence to overcome, making the burden of proof here for the skeptic very high. 
Now, let's transition to contention three. I will be arguing for the reliability of the New Testament. To be clear, this is not me saying that the New Testament is reliable, therefore the resurrection happened. This is me saying that the New Testament is reliable and that therefore we have access to what the eyewitness accounts originally said, which will therefore serve as evidence in favor of the resurrection. So why should we think this? <clears throat> Two things. First, we have internal evidence that shows that the New Testament contains the texture of historical documents that include a reliable eyewitness testimony and intends to betray accurate history. And then we also have external confirmations, which show the authors got hard things right, things that someone who was not close to the facts would have a hard time replicating or making up. First, let's consider the authorship of the Gospels. Our Bibles contain four Gospels labeled with the names of the four traditional authors. This is important because if this is the case, then we have documents written by two eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus, as well as two documents written by people close to the people who were eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus. And there's a few tests we can use to confirm the identities of the authors. First of all, there are no anonymous copies of the four Gospels. Zero. Every single shred of manuscript evidence we have that is complete enough to include the first and last page of the document or the beginning and ending of the scroll attributes them to the traditional authors. There's no historical evidence that the originals had no titles. Next, from 180 on, we have strong and consistent external attestations of who wrote the Gospels. This is before the internet, the printing press, and Christians were a persecuted minority. Travel was dangerous and expensive, yet... We have a geographical spread of universal attestation, all in agreement of who wrote the Gospels in the early church, as you can see on this map. The documents also contain data that would be surprising if they were not written by the people ascribed. Here are some quick examples of this. Matthew, an alleged tax collector, was clearly focused on money. John shows knowledge of Palestinian geography. Mark, who is writing down Peter's words, shows knowledge of first century Jewish customs and has Peter front and center in his Gospel. Luke, who was a doctor, was written by someone who was trained in physician's terms. These next few points are a little textbooky, but they're important, so bear with me here. The accounts read just like you would expect if they were early, accurate historical accounts based on eyewitness testimony. For example, look at Luke's opening. This is a translation by New Testament scholar Luke Vandewey. And as he points out, scholars also compare Luke's approach to historical reportage with that of other ancient historians. Luke's gospel uses language like accomplished among us and refers to white witnesses delivering accounts to us, indicating an informed familiarity with the events. And we can also look at how Luke writes just like historians of his time. Consider, for instance, the words of Demosthenes in an ancient work titled Against Olympiodorus. Both employ similar language, positioning themselves as having an inside perspective and a unique qualification to judge accurately. Upon closer examination of the Greek text, nearly every key word in Demosthenes' speech is echoed in Luke's prologue. And this direct parallel serves as evidence that Luke's gospel is authored by someone intent on conveying accurate history based on eyewitness accounts. Next, scholars widely agree that the author of Luke is also the author of Acts. Regarding Acts containing eyewitness accounts, scholars often cite the we passages starting in Acts 16.10. Here, the author uses the word we in a way suggesting personal involvement in the events described, and this also implies that the author of Luke Acts was a companion of Paul. New Testament scholar Craig Keener highlights the significance of the we narratives in Acts, suggesting they reflect the narrator's firsthand experience. Moving on from just internal cues, we also have many external confirmations. For example, classical historian Colin Hemer wrote a meticulous book, and in it he presents 84 factual confirmations that bolster the credibility of Acts. While we won't delve into each detail for the sake of time, these confirmations encompass a wide array of accurate details that are best explained by the source of these writings being historically reliable eyewitness accounts. I can't fit 84 on the screen. Here's five uh, for, to start. Another external confirmation of the Gospels comes in their form of knowledge of personal names. This is known in the relevant scholarship as onomastic congruence. This is particularly significant considering the diverse and nuanced cultural landscape of the Greco-Roman world. A recent study by Luke Vandewey points this out. Take a look at this table, which compares the top 12 Jewish male names. It offers insight into the naming conventions during the time frame of 30 BC to 90 AD. When we look at the data, the occurrences of the names in the Gospels and Acts line up with the top names. 
This is remarkable because the data we have for the names and places in other pl in time, oh my gosh, other no, names and places in, don't line up with the names we have here. For example, there were many Jews in Egypt in the time of the New Testament as well as Alexandria. But as you can see by this table, Jews in Egypt had a very different set of names compared to Jews in Palestine as found in Jewish inscriptions from there. And the same goes for Jews in Libya and Western Turkey. Not only that, but when we contrast the Gospels and Acts with later less reliable works, we observe a significant disparity. These later accounts are incongruent with the naming conventions we saw, indicating a lack of accuracy and attention to detail in the portrayals of names and identities. For example, we have the second century Gospel of Judas. This just has two names suitable for Palestinian Jewish names, Judas and Jesus. However, it introduces a great many names that are not consistent with the conventions that era and region. In essence, if the New Testament accurately reflects the historical context of Jesus' time and place, we would anticipate consistency with the naming conventions of that era and region. Conversely, if the authors were detached from the Jesus' time and place or providing an accurate history, we would expect naming conventions divergent from the norms of that period, akin to what we observe in the text like the Gospel of Judas. Therefore, since the Gospels are, inconsist are consistent with the naming conventions of that era and region, this is evidence that they're reliable. So I've given a case for the reliability of the New Testament, and now I want to reiterate, I'm not saying the New Testament's reliable, therefore the resurrection happened. What I am arguing again is that the New Testament's reliable, and, the, and that includes the accounts represent what the original alleged eyewitnesses actually said. So now I'm going to be looking at specific historical evidence for the resurrection, and while we go over the points, remember the preliminaries I mentioned in the beginning. I'll be showing confirmations of the resurrection and showing why the competing theories are less likely. And one last note is that because I've argued that the New Testament is reliable, that leaves us with two theories that actually can compete with the resurrection, that either the eyewitnesses were lying or they were mistaken. To be clear, there's other theories you can hold than th these, but without a takedown of the New, of New Testament reliability, that won't work. Now, the initial point to consider, obviously, is Jesus' death by crucifixion. For Jesus to have risen, he must have been dead. Uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion is the consensus among scholars and supported by abundance of evidence. Um, but after that, Jesus died. after Jesus died, he was shortly thereafter buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And as a reminder, we've established the reliability of the New Testament, and the empty tomb is attested multiple, multiple times. The Jewish leadership was not happy with this movement, and they could have easily produced Jesus' body to stop it from progressing. But this never happened. The location of the tomb would have most likely been known by most people as well, and we have multiple lines of witnesses. Furthermore, as you can see by the screen, we have multiple enemy attestations of the empty tomb as well. It was also discovered by women, marking them as the first witnesses to the resurrection. This is significant because first century Jewish Palestinian culture had a low view of the testimony of women, specifically their testimony to miracles and divine revelations. For instance, Jewish law often disregarded the testimony of women, considering it unreliable due to the boldness of their sex. Their words, not mine. And as you can see, there's references on the screen again. This satisfies the criterion of embarrassment, which is, which is a principle used by historians to assess the reliability of historical accounts. It suggests that if an embarrassing or socially awkward detail is included in a narrative, especially one that would be detrimental to the author's or group's credibility, it is likely to be authentic rather than fabricated. And this doesn't just apply to authenticating one or two events involving women. It enforces the reliability of the whole document because it tells us that they were dedicated to telling us what actually happened, even if it hurts their public case. Next is the testimony of the post-mortem appearances of Jesus. People claimed to have experienced encounters with him after his death. The witnesses are not uniform groups of religious zealots. They are diverse, they're from diverse backgrounds with different educations and social standings. Here, I present the table detailing these recorded appearances. Aside from the appearance of the 500, the number of unique witnesses goes up as high as 21. This leads to my next point. As you can see by this chart, the individuals who bore witness to the resurrected Jesus didn't just catch a glimpse of him. Their experiences were rich and multi-sensory. They didn't just see him. They heard his voice, felt his touch, engaged in conversation with him, and even shared meals in his presence. They include times, places, and even reactions of the, wit of the witnesses. And they claim to have even heard Jesus himself tell them he rose from the dead. And each of these testimonies has some bearing of independence. As Dr. Lydia McGrew says in a 2020 article, when we get into the details, we see clear marks of some independence in the accounts. Their testimonies are not bare assertions that the event happened. 
They include details that interlock with each other, suggesting credibility, and they include details that others do not, which suggests some sort of independence. These combined factors bolster the credibility of the testimony and are evidence against collusion. To entertain the hallucination hypothesis, one would need to posit an extraordinary scenario. It would be an instance where everything we know about hallucinations would be suspended with, one individ with individuals experiencing the same exceptionally rare polymodal hallucination over 40 days, despite lacking an anticipation of Jesus' resurrection. This hallucination would need to be uniform for all witnesses, imparting identical instructions, allowing physical interaction and even sharing meals, in such a consistent, widespread hallucination on at least 10 different occasions, with at least 21 unique witnesses across a 40-day timeline, seems to me to be a miraculous event in and of itself. Moving on, we have, the con we have the conversion of Paul. Because of the reliability of Acts, we can have confidence that this is Paul's actual testimony. This next point is very important. Paul claimed that Jesus not only identified himself, but also explicitly endorsed the teaching of the very people Paul was persecuting by saying, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Paul then, given the overwhelming and explicit nature of this experience, the partial mutualness of the experience between him and the companions, and its occurrence while he was wide awake, as his companions could attest, quite understandably concluded that it was real, and hence that Jesus really had risen from the dead, as preached by the Christians. Furthermore, these individuals would have expected a hostile reception when they start, started spreading their message of the resurrected Jesus. To the Gentiles, the Christian message would have been repulsive, worshiping a man shamefully executed on the cross and believing a physical resurrection, an idea contrary to the prevailing pagan beliefs of the time. To the Jews, the idea of a crucified Messiah was scandalous, shattering a long-held expectation of a triumphant leader, and Jesus' death left his followers in disarray, fleeing persecution and facing shattered ideals. If they were going to make something up, why make something up that they knew would cost them socially and physically with no earthly reward? Indeed, many of those who claim to have witnessed the risen Jesus not only anticipated a hostile reception, but also willingly endured suffering and even death for their belief in the resurrection. Both Christian and non-Christian sources can confirm this. And as I stated earlier, Paul himself admits to being a persecutor of Christians. It's more plausible that they suffered and died for something they sincerely believed and experienced firsthand, rather than a fleeting hallucination or fabricated story. And an important side note here, these early Christians suffered not for a mere belief, but for what they perceived as an empirical fact, having witnessed to the risen, to the risen Jesus because they were in a position to know the truth. Finally, let's get into our main points now. Remember the questions we needed to answer. What is the prior probability of the resurrection of Jesus? What are the odds of the evidence if the, if the resurrection happened? And what are the odds of the evidence if the event did not occur? In summary, our case began with establishing the prior probability of the resurrection not being too low. Then we ex examined compelling evidence for the reliability of the New Testament, which contains firsthand testimonies of the resurrected Christ from the original eyewitnesses. These witnesses endured hostility, suffering, and even death for their proclamation, and we have testimonies from at least 21 unique individuals, including skeptics like James and Paul, across over, four, uh, across over 10 occasions, spanning 40 days, all corroborating the reality of the resurrection with an empty tomb to back it up. This is exactly what we'd expect to see if Jesus had risen from the dead. But now ask yourself this, how likely would, I, would it be to see these things if Jesus was dead? If you're unsure about this, let me give you an example of what things would look like. Simon Bar Kokhba was a Jewish rebel military leader who was hailed as the Messiah by his followers. After his execution, what, what do you think happened? Do we have any testimony of a resurrected Messiah? An empty tomb? The short answer is we have nothing. His movement died out as a stark contrast to what we see with Jesus. And this is only one example. There are many more, as you can see, by the list of other quote-unquote messiahs who died out on their faith with no claims of resurrection. Um, so, therefore, we can come to this conclusion. The evidence strongly confirms the resurrection of Jesus. When we look at the likelihood ratio, the data is extremely favorable for the resurrection and very, very unfavorable to the competing theories. Now, I want to say this. Uh, if Matt wants to interact with this argument, one minute. If Matt wants to interact with this argument, or anybody that wants to say the conclusion is not true, the objector must do one of or a combination of the following things: um, argue that the prior for the resurrection is so low that the evidence can't overcome it; attack the data itself; attack the explanation of the data by giving or by giving a better one. And if we stay within my methodological parameters of this case, this logically exhausts the options. Now, to be clear, Matt can bring his own methodology to the table. 
and that would need to be defended, but my argument must be interacted with on its own merits. So if these things are not met by the end of the debate, we can reasonably conclude that the resurrection is the best explanation of the data. Thank you for your time. Please welcome Matt Dillahunty for his opening statement. Probably. Is that working now? How's everybody doing? You're not supposed to talk to me or clap. You didn't listen to the instructions. First of all, I want to thank everybody for showing up and a huge thank you to Crosswind Church for putting this together. Uh, John in particular, I'm going to actually vamp until they start the clock so I don't cheat and get extra time because it's at zero. Um, but I, I like the fact that Pastor John started with a prayer because it allows me to see whose head doesn't bow and whose eyes remain open. So I know he's on my side. Uh, I don't know why I took my glasses off. I'm not going to be able to read anything. Okay, you, you just yell at me from the back. So, uh, let me see where my notes are. All right. If you guys enjoy this conversation, and I heard that the, for those watching on the stream, I heard the stream went down briefly for part of Than's presentation, so... Uh, you may, you may have like a four or five minute thing to make up somewhere else. Hopefully it stays on for my part because that'll give me an advantage. Uh, not much of one, but a little bit. Uh, we're debating the topic of whether or not the resurrection of Jesus is probably an actual historical event. And my position is that it's probably not. This is unusual because I'm often accused of just being the guy who shows up to talk about the burden of proof and say, oh, I don't believe that, I'm not convinced, not convinced, not convinced. It really irritates everybody who interacts with me. But that's too bad because that's the way skepticism works and that's the way the burden of proof works. In this case, we specifically said it so that we could talk about probabilities. And I'm not really going to require you to look at formulas or math, but we are going to talk about a sort of intuitive discernment, I guess, of the probabilities of certain claims. So if we have claims from history, how do we go about confirming whether or not those claims are likely, whether or not they probably occurred? Uh, because we don't have time machines, as far as I know. The investigation process, ideally, looks for sources that are uh, near the events, temporarily speaking, not, not decades or so later, uh, that are primary sources, hopefully people involved or eyewitnesses when possible. Reliable, uh, ooh, reliable contemporary historians, people who were around at the same time and are good reporters of those things. Reports from all sides of an event. If there's a war and only one side tells a story, we shouldn't be as confident that their story is correct as if the other side is telling similar stories. And then we get down to independent investigations and whether or not those sources are documented. Is that time right? That's wonderful. Am I getting a whole? It's close enough. Than's like, he's getting eight minutes more than me. And then the, probably the lowest end are dubious contemporaries, or dubious people who weren't even contemporaries. As we go through and look at the sorts of claims and the sort of people who are making those claims and the evidence, we also need to consider the nature of the claim. A mundane claim like Steve built a boat, no big deal. We have plenty of evidence that boats exist and people build boats. A slightly more extraordinary claim uh, that Steve built a huge boat for a massive storm, and then the incredibly extraordinary claim that some might consider outlandish or absurd, Noah built a boat that he was able to hold representatives of all the species on Earth in order to survive a global flood. The type of evidence that we might need for those claims is gonna be a little bit different because the claim about a boat is consistent with mountains of evidence that we already have, and the claims about a global flood is inconsistent with the evidence that we already have. When we consider the nature of the claim, if you look at a global flood, that's something that might actually leave verifiable empirical evidence that we can go out and discover. Turns out, not so much. 
when you look at a claim like, was somebody resurrected? Is that the sort of claim that might leave independently verifiable empirical evidence? Probably not, but that won't prevent people from making the claim that they have some empirical evidence for it. If we look at a claim like, is there evolutionarily speaking a common ancestry between humans and great apes? That's something that could leave independently verifiable empirical evidence, like the fusing of chromosome two, which kind of confirms, along with a bulk of other evidence, the common ancestry that we share with our other great apes. What about a claim like George Washington couldn't tell a lie and definitely chopped down that cherry tree? The nature of that claim is a little different as well. It's difficult to investigate. You would want to check the sources that I listed before. But it's also the type of story that is fanciful and unlikely to be true. This Sunday is an incredibly important day for me because it's my birthday. <laughs> I know for the rest of you it's something to do with Jesus, but that date keeps moving around. But uh, there's no reason for you to care about my birthday, but uh, I'll be 55. I was born in March of 1969. Thank you. Uh, stop talking to me. In July of 1969, we landed on the moon. There are people today who don't think that happened. There are people today who, no matter what evidence you put in front of them, will deny that that happened. Francis, or, uh, the the uh, Stanley Kubrick got together with some people in a studio and filmed it, and it's all just a fiction. If you believe that, the rest of this debate is not going to go well for you. Um, the, it's probably we landed on the moon. Almost certainly we landed on the moon. I'm a skeptic. There's a difference between skepticism and cynicism. Skepticism isn't just saying, nope, I don't believe it. Nope, I don't believe it. It's about trying to define what should convince us and making sure we have good standards of evidence. In May of 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted in one of the, well, the deadliest and economically destructive uh, volcanic eruptions in the history of the, of the modern United States, in any case. 57 people died, 200 homes were destroyed, 47 bridges were destroyed, 15 miles of railway were destroyed, 185 miles of highway were destroyed. There's a big crevice there where the mountain used to be. I haven't heard any conspiracy theories suggesting that didn't happen. I won't say it absolutely happened, even though I watched it. But it pretty certainly happened. The interesting thing, though, is that I have a cousin who showed up just a week later with a little vial of volcanic ash from Mount St. Helens. How does he know that's from Mount St. Helens and not from somebody who just picked some stuff up or burnt some firewood in the backyard and stuffed it in there? He didn't bother to investigate, and neither would you, probably. Neither would I, because it doesn't matter if what's in the vial is actually something relevant to Mount St. Helens. It's just a cool thing, and it reminds you of it, and that's good enough. While I'm an advocate for knowing as many true things and as few false things as possible, uh, well, I'm okay with not knowing absolutely everything. It'd be nice, but I recognize that it's an impractical thing. What about other claims? I, I watched a, a quick short video from my friend Seth today, although it's from years ago, and he was talking about a cancer survivors forum online where they made a post saying, after prayer and a year and a half of chemotherapy, I am now 100% cancer free. Now for a lot of the people in this room, you're like, yes, praise the Lord. For the other people in this room, the ones that didn't bow their heads, why on earth did we mention prayer? If I'd have said, after rubbing my lucky rabbit's foot for a while and chemotherapy for a year and a half, I'm now cancer-free, people would look at me like I had three heads. Because we don't consider, generally, lucky rabbit's feet to have anything to do with cancer recovery. Yet we do, some of us, tend to think that there's a God who's going to intervene and potentially cure cancers. A little selective about who he does or doesn't care. For any of those claims, we may never know the answer. We may never reach a conclusion about how likely or probable something is, especially if we're trying to tie a cause to an event. But what we can do is we can begin analyzing the sources. If there isn't empirical evidence of a resurrection of Jesus, and I'm unaware of any, then the next thing is to go to the source. 
And the primary source is the Bible. Now, I understand before people get all up in arms, the Bible is 66 books by a bunch of, your, your Bible, the Protestant Bible, is 66 books by a bunch of different authors, uh, and so it would be a problem for me to fault the author of Matthew for the, what the author of Kings wrote and vice versa. But can we at least for today agree that the Bible, despite being a collection of books, is a package deal that has been put together specifically for a purpose and that the primary claim of most advocates of the Bible is that if there's a cohesive narrative there, it's all the word of God or inspired by God, etc. So we'll just take it as one thing for now. It was curated with a bias, but that bias doesn't mean that it's false. I want to make sure because sometimes when I use a word, people get up in arms. You're claiming it's biased. Hey, I got a bias towards truth and reality. It's, it's okay. But what other claims does that book or that collection of books make? What claims do we have to consider when we consider the entirety of that for its reliability? Uh, a flood, a global flood, a local flood, we're not necessarily sure. I don't know what your church actually teaches because there's competing views on it. An ark where all the species were uh, located. Somebody survived in a big fish for three days. There were people living to be 500 to 969 years old. The Nile River turned into blood. Moses' wife circumcised their kid and threw the foreskin at God to keep him from killing Moses. There's talking donkey, a talking serpent. Um, David collects 100 foreskins so that he can buy a bride. The sun stands still in the sky for an entire day. Kind of conflicts with at least what we know about physics. And note that I'm not saying these didn't happen. I'm not saying that you can't violate physics. I'm not saying miracles are impossible. I'm saying before I can believe they are possible, we need to see good evidence for those things. So if we look at these and we're trying to figure out what's the likelihood that these events happened, what's the probability that these events happened, it seems some people would like to say they're all impossible. I don't know how you concluded that. I don't know how potentially unfalsifiable things can be labeled as impossible. There's a difference between a logical possibility, which everything's logically possible to you, rule it out with a defeater. And then there's what's an empirical possibility. And I'm an advocate that empirical possibilities need to be demonstrated. And so do empirical impossibilities. So rather than concluding that this is impossible or possible, I don't know. But does that sound like a credible source, given what we know about reality, with all of those outlandish stories? It doesn't to me, but that doesn't mean they're wrong. And some people would be like, well, that's the Old Testament. Um, okay, Jesus performed a lot of miracles supposedly that I also am not convinced happened. I don't see compelling evidence for them. They are stories and some of them don't make much sense. Like when there's a whole bunch of people who are possessed by demons and Jesus drives the demons into a bunch of pigs that then run off a cliff and die. Why? In other areas of the Bible when we cast out demons they're just cast out. Why did we send a bunch of pigs to their death? And when those pigs die, do the demons die too? Or do the demons just get to go back to wherever they were before? It's, it seems to be an absurdly cruel thing to do. There's some difficulty in reconciling the various Easter accounts or the resurrection accounts in the four gospels. There are, if I can open my phone, there are disparities. Maybe they're not a big deal between where there, which women were at the tomb, were there guards at the tomb, what was the time of this, what was the reason for the visit, was the stone already rolled away, did an earthquake happen and roll the stone away while they were there, did they enter the tomb at all, did the disciples visit the tomb, did the disciples enter the tomb, what did the disciples see, uh, what did Jesus say to the women, what was the first appearance, or Jesus' first appearance to the disciples, there's slightly different versions of this, and what we're largely told, I'm not going to speak for then, is that that's to be expected. Like, we're going to describe an elephant, and different people are going to describe it differently. So we're telling kind of the same story, and that's fine. And it shows the human side of this. But if this is supposed to be the inspired word of an almighty God who is giving sound evidentiary warrant to believe what should be the most important event in the history of the world, that's pretty weak. There are other resurrections in the Bible. 
I didn't know as much about this when I was growing up. Um, of course, Elijah's got the, the, the first one uh, where he resurrects the son of a widow. And then Elisha comes along because Elijah is spirited up to heaven in a whirlwind, uh, never dies, which is kind of weird. But Elisha comes along once double Elijah's power and has evidently granted it. So Elisha also raises the son, not of a widow this time, but of a woman who he uh, told her that she would have a child. She did, and then the child got sick and died, and they sent for him, and he came and raised that kid up. Uh, and, but we've got to give him double the power. So Elisha dies and hasn't done a second resurrection. So when the Moabites are invading, they happen to show up at, in the middle of a funeral, and in order to safeguard the body, they chuck the body into Elisha's tomb. And when that dead body touched Elisha's bones, it came back to life. Now, when I was a Christian, this is all the power of God, not Elijah. Prophets have no power. There's no power for Elijah to grant to Elisha. These passages are very confusing about where the source of power is, and it's why we end up selling bits and pieces of the saints and selling bits of the cross. Jesus then comes along and is compared to Elijah and Elisha, not by name, but they compared him to those prophets. Uh, resurrects Jairus' daughter, a young man in name. In Luke, Lazarus, obviously, we all, you know, everybody heard about that one. Uh, and then Paul resurrects uh, Tabitha and, and potentially Utica, so there's, there's some potential problems with that. I just released a video about all these other resurrections. They're not relevant uh, to the details of Jesus' resurrection, but they are relevant to the reliability of the source. And some of these are presented with nothing. That story about Elisha where they throw the body into his tomb and it comes in contact with the bones and it comes back to life, that's the whole story. It's two verses. Now hang on. These are remarkable events. These are the sort of things that you'd want to say, hey, here's some evidence. Nope. They're tossed around as if they're just so stories. So is it probable? What's the likelihood of miracles? I don't know. What's the likelihood of a resurrection? I don't know. But there's a side question that's kind of important, which is, is it even possible? Because as we'll get into a little bit during the rebuttal and addressing things, doing a Bayesian analysis requires you to have good priors. What if it's not possible? What if your assessment of your best guess and then revising it with data, which I'll get into a little later, gives you a probability percentage that's high or low, but still wrong? What do you do then? For the resurrection of Jesus, we have no empirical evidence that I'm aware of. We have no confirmed primary sources, although there are sources that are claimed to be primary sources, eyewitnesses and accounts from those people about other eyewitnesses, but that'd at least be secondary. We have no way of investigating the claim. There are no contemporary historians' accounts of the resurrection. The closest that we have there is Josephus with a disputed passage that just states it as a thing that happened, but doesn't present any sources or verification or evidence uh, to go along that way. There are no accounts from all sides, like, yep, this Jesus guy rose, but we really don't like him. Okay, that's ridiculous. That's probably not going to happen, but you still don't have those sorts of claims. You have no independent investigations and no way to dig in on it. What you have are dubious sources, the bottom of the barrel of the list that I made at the beginning. Because the Bible is propaganda. Propaganda isn't necessarily a bad thing. Apologists and evangelists are sharing what they believe to be true. The Bible is propaganda. It is selected writings that go towards a particular goal, which is to convince people of the things that the authors believed. Its style isn't so much historical as fanciful on, to, on occasion. And again, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it doesn't mean it did. How many confirmed resurrections do we have? I'm not aware of a single confirmed resurrection of any sort of where someone has died, been entombed, and rose again. But it wouldn't surprise me. 
that something like that happened somewhere. There's a reason why people put bells on graves once upon a time just in case you got buried alive. But the presumption there was that you got buried alive, that somebody wrongfully determined you're dead. So in order to claim that there's been a resurrection, you need to have, first of all, some confirmation that they were in fact dead. And if the entirety of the evidence of their death and resurrection is in a propaganda story from a biased source, whether it's true or not, that's a bit of a problem. If you read the Bible, it anticipates the objections and poisons the well. It misrepresents good evidential standards by actually suggesting that doubt isn't good. Doubting Thomas, when he's told by the others that they've seen Jesus, says, I'm not going to believe it till I see it and I'm able to put my hands, my, put my fingers through the holes in his hands and stuff like that. Jesus shows up to Thomas. Thomas puts his fingers through there and Jesus basically says, you know, you've seen and now you believe, but blessed are those who believe having not seen. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to desperately try not to necessarily offend everybody who believes this, but that is really bad epistemology. That is the epistemology that allows you to be conned. And by doing it preemptively, saying you don't need to see this, blessed are you who believe not having seen, that is setting you up to believe in the absence of evidence. So God, rather than pre presenting the best possible evidence, is presenting the weakest evidence, accounts that we can't confirm, from sources that we can't confirm. We can suspect, we can talk about the likelihood, and we can talk about how honest they probably were, but you can be sincere and sincerely wrong. And you can be misrepresented and have your words twisted after the fact. Five minutes. Thank you. The Bible also gives people the suggestion that there is empirical evidence. What's the number one thing I've heard from Christians over the past 20 years? Empty tomb, empty tomb, explain the empty tomb. Explain. You want me to explain a hole in the ground? A hole in the ground that you can't confirm exists or ever contained Jesus, let alone that the absence of a Jesus is somehow confirmation of a miraculous resurrection? There's no explanation needed for an empty tomb. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus ends with this same parable. I would have you raise your hand and ask if you knew what it was, but you guys aren't supposed to applaud or interact, so I won't. It's basically a warning about the fool builds his house on sand and the wise man builds his house on the rock. I'd ask you what the verse before that says, or the verse before that. I would imagine most of the Christians listening to this, like me, when I was a believer, I imagine all of you have read the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, probably many times, probably heard sermons on it many times. Do you remember it word for word? In English, in Greek, in Aramaic. When people are in university, they take notes. There might be somebody here taking notes on what I say now, although you're doing it with a phone, so you'll get the best recording. But if you take notes, did you get every word? So what's the likelihood that millennia ago, someone standing there listening to Jesus give a sermon they didn't have a ballpoint pen and paper, didn't have any recording devices, managed to get it right, all right, word for word, pretty low, which is why some people's apologetics is, well, it's a theme. We got the general things. But also, the New Testament scholars suggest that there was some copying going on between the different Gospels, which isn't all that surprising, especially when they're telling the same stories. So don't build your house on the sand. Build it on the rock. Great story. Because sand shifts and is changing. It's unreliable. And so are stories. And so are memories. And so are copies of copies of translations of copies of stories and memories. Desert sand, by the way, is useless for making concrete. Beach sand is wonderful for 
concrete, but you have to add other aggregates and water to make the cement and get it in there. The Bible claims need to be demonstrated to be first good sand. Then we need to add in accurate data and reliable accounts to get anything close to concrete, which simply, in my view, has not happened. What we have is desert sand of dubious reliability. And therefore, while I can't say this didn't happen, I certainly can't say that it probably happened. I have no other resurrections to confirm. The various miracle accounts in the Bible haven't been confirmed, don't have supporting evidence. So what we have are stories. And this ultimately, I think, will come down to, do you believe the story? If you do, then you're going to conclude and engage in priors and Bayesian analysis that the resurrection probably happened. And if you don't believe the story, you're probably going to have a different set of priors. You may even be one of the people, please, atheists, stop doing stuff like this. You may be one of the people, it's, oh, it's impossible, miracles can't happen. You are doing harm uh, when you do that by suggesting that you're closed-minded. I have no idea if miracles can happen. I'm just not convinced a possibility has been demonstrated. 30 seconds. Let alone a probability. Thank you. At this time, we will move into the rebuttal from Than Christopoulos. Set the timer for 10 minutes. Nice job, Matt. All right. Is that your rebuttal? <laughs> yes, I yield my time. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, first of all, I just want to reiterate, I've given an argument for the reliability of the Gospels in Acts and the New Testament at large. Um, so I just want you to remember that as I go through this. I, I, I understand that was Matt's opening, so he's not directly giving a rebuttal to the argument that I just gave in my opening statement. I'm patiently awaiting for that in his rebuttal phase. So if I, if I sound nitpicky or anything like that, I'm just doing a rebuttal, and that's what I got to do. Um, so one of the things that Matt said was that we have a, well, a few different issues with the Gospels. One of them being that, I um, believe you said, eyewitness testimony is not reliable. There's a small problem with this. We're leaving out part of that statement, which is we know when eyewitness testimony is unreliable. Here are some marks of unreliability. The events happen quickly over a period of time, uh, over, over seconds or minutes. The participants are strangers to one another. And if there's a weapon present, such as a knife or gun, that also is an instance where reliability of the testimony can be scrutinized. If there's a gun in front of you, you're typically going to be focused on the weapon instead of what's going on with everybody else. None of these conditions are present for the resurrection appearances, though. Another point that I wanted to go out over was um, Matt brought up a contradiction, and that was um, how many women were at the tomb. So if we look at the passages, we have John 20, verse 1, Matthew 28, verse 1, and Mark 16, verse 1, Luke 24, verse 1. And so I'll just kind of read through kind of a brief here that I have on this. And rule number one of reading anything, especially the Bible, is never read one verse. All we need to do is keep reading to see that this isn't the case at all with this contradiction. We know um, what's going on here if we just put everything together. So, for instance, in John 20, verse 2, it says, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. But then, where did that we come from if Mary Magdalene was alone? Um, I could spend a lot of time on gospel contradictions here, but I don't want to devote too much time here to all those. I've answered that in a lot of different places in my work, and many other cr Christians have answered that as well. What I, the main thing I just wanted to point out there is that there's reasonable answers to a lot of these alleged discrepancies. Uh, Matt also brings up um, now that, and this is a point of agreement, that when we're talking about Bayesian analysis, we want to have good priors. And I agree that people can make mistakes when they're assessing the prior probability of some type of an event. But the nice thing about Bayesian analysis, and I think this will be another point of agreement between Matt and I, is that we can look at the evidence sequentially and update the prior probability 
um, and then eventually keep getting closer to what the prior probability of the event should be and that final probability of the event would be. That's really nerdy math stuff, but I think Matt and I would agree with, on that with. Okay, cool. Um, Matt also brings up uh, an, a really interesting point, and I actually really value this, and it's related. I don't know if we can get into this during our cross-examination or open discussion area, but pretty much he says, if this is what happened, this would be the most single important event in history, so why is that even subject to debate? Now, one thing that I might say is Matt is making an implicit claim here, and that is that if God exists and this is real, um, he would want this to be presented in a way that's just provable, not debatable. Um, after all, perhaps, though, God might have good reasons for wanting this to be in, in the epistemic middle ground, giving us enough evidence to warrant or justify belief, but not such that it forces belief. Now, skeptics and atheists might, and I'm not saying Matt's going to do this, but People will often kind of call these things excuses rather than reasons, but what I would contend is that relabeling this as an excuse doesn't magically make the reason I'm giving not work. Um, we have to show why these reasons don't explain the data or why positing those explanations lowers the probability of God's existence. Um, besides, at least at best then, this is, might be weak evidence against the resurrection indirectly by trying to lower the probability of God's existence. Um, but if Matt wants to have a debate on, Matt, on divine hiddenness, I'm happy to set that up too. Um, but for now, I want to focus on the resurrection of Jesus. And one last thing I want to note here is, though, that this type of objection actually kind of reinforces a point that I'm trying to make here on conditional probabilities. Um, it, 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 the, the main point I want to get here is that Matt is making a claim here about what God would do and pointing to data that references a degree of support or lack of support for this God claim based on this intuition we have about God, what God would and wouldn't do. So we don't need statistical data of what God would or wouldn't do, but we, so what we have is the ability to make these conditional statements about the data in form degrees of support the data offers. Um, what else? Um, Matt also says that we're, like, you're not having enough evidence, that we not, don't have enough evidence. And this is, I think, one of the places that we disagree with a lot. Um, Matt might be coming at this from a different methodological perspective than I will be. So me as a Bayesian, I'm looking at posterior likelihood ratios and conditionalizing those with the, uh, with the hypotheses. Now, Matt, that doesn't require me to have so much evidence that I prove something. If I have, in a Bayesian analysis, hypotheses that are logically exhaustive of the data I'm trying to explain, if the, pro if the probability is higher than the rest of the competing theories, even if the probability of the theory is 0.5, I've logically exhausted the option, and I've logically exhausted the options, the most reasonable thing to do is to believe the thing with the highest probability. We can probably get into that into the weeds a little bit more in our open discussion here. Um, and this is where I want you guys to remember something. Matt's methodology might be different than mine, and we can talk about those methodological disputes, but I want you guys to remember those three questions that we asked in the beginning of my opening statement. What are the odds? What's the prior probability of a resurrection to Jesus? And that's something we can get into about how we assess that. Um, what are the odds of the evidence if Jesus did not rise from the dead? And what are the odds of the evidence if Jesus um, did rise from the dead? Um, Matt also brought up that memory is unreliable. And I probably don't have all the time in the world to kind of go through all this, this stuff. But for one, um, in, in his opening, Matt didn't really give too many studies for this claim. But I have a plethora of research to kind of help us here. Uh, for starters, the data we currently have um, is not enough to make sweeping generalizations about memory. And the methodology we have used to collect data thus far is actually somewhat skewed. For example, sometimes studies focus on tasks that are difficult to retain, and others have attempted to induce false memories that don't accurately map onto the reality of how we typically retain information. Gillian Cohen, in a paper titled Memory in the Real World, on page 389, says that the experiments go so far as to say that in experiments, it's usually more informative to set a task difficulty at a level where people make errors, so the nature of the errors and conditions that provoke them can be identified. In fact, we have several studies where the expected reports of memories to be 40% accurate, but they were surprised to find that, the, that they were closer to 93 to 95% accurate. Some of these studies include a case of study of eyewitness testimony of memory crime by Yu Lee, J.C., and Kutschel, um, memory of randomly sampled autobiographical events by Brewer William F., the truth is out there, accuracy and recall of variable real-world events, and so on. The other thing that to note is that the reliability of memory is going to be dependent on the type of memory that is formed in the person's mind. Remembering that the person who sat adjacent to you at lunch, who wore a blue shirt, is much different 
than, for instance, the day of your wedding. So the former will not produce reliable memory, while the latter does. As Dr. Robert McIver says, most psychological experiments on memory focus on periods of seconds and minutes rather than periods as long as 30 to 60 years that most likely intervened between the crucifixion resurrection and writing the Gospels furthermore. The stimulus materials usually used in psychological experiments are quite different from the materials found in synoptic Gospels. For time's sake, I won't go over all the types of memories out there, but the resurrection appearances would fall under the category of something called personal event memories, or PEMS for short. The research has shown that important, emotionally impacting, life-changing events form memories that are retained well for decades. Um, Doctor of Psychology at University of New Hampshire, David B. Pilmer, lays out the criteria for what counts as a PEM. Um, and I don't have the time to read this all off right now, so Matt, if you want to go over that at some point, we can. Um, but these are the types of memories that we form from a person defining personal experiences, trauma or key experiences with loved ones. And these are the types of memories that the people who are eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus would have had. So while I appreciate this general, pro this general gesture to memory being unreliable, we're, I'm, more, I'm more wanting to know what type of memory these eyewitnesses would have had and it seems to me, based off the research, if these testimonies are what the original eyewitnesses said and these One minute. were the places that they were, a PEM is the type of memory that these people most likely have had, seeing somebody who had just risen from the dead. Um, 40 seconds left. Matt, do you say anything else I should address? Probably <laughs> <laughs> not. Uh, yeah, I'll just, anything else will probably just come up on a cross-exam. Um, I really appreciate the time here. Give Matt a hand of applause again. He did awesome. Please welcome Matt Delahunty for his rebuttal. Set the timer to 10 minutes, please. While they're resetting the timer, first of all, this is really nice. Those of you who have seen some of my more recent debates against some people, well, I won't say those words in church, uh, just out of respect for you guys invite me down. Uh, this is, uh, we're no longer doing Jerry Springer debates, so amen, praise the Lord, whatever. <laughs> oh, all right. I'm losing time. So on uh, Bayesian analysis, here's the thing. If you found out that somebody had a baby and you were gonna try and estimate what the probability was that the baby was a boy, you can just put it at 50%. For all my non-binary friends, I'm saying approximately, and we're talking about something different. But uh, what if you found out that the baby's name was Sue? Well, that changes the probability that it's a boy a bit because Sue's a rather unusual name for a boy, and that might lower it. This is where uh, Than and I are both in agreement that one of the great things about Bayesian analysis is that you are constantly updating what you could be, have the most ridiculous priors you wanted as long as they're not like zero or a hundred percent and as long as you are constantly adding new information you are revising your priors so that you're honing in on what is the most reliable or most accurate probability. I was, cool. Then when you find out that uh, Johnny Cash wrote a song called A Boy Named Sue does that change the weight? Well, sure. It might make it more likely or less likely, kind of your, a matter of your opinion. But then, after you know that that song's been out and got popular, are people going to actually start naming their boys Sue or giving them Sue as a middle name? But, so there's lots of different ways to address those things. What if you're trying to calculate the, the probability that I have a time travel machine? Well, I don't know what probability you start with, but let's start with really, really low. Uh, and then when you say, hang on a minute ago, uh, you know, just last week your beard was much shorter, how did it get so long so quickly? Maybe that increases the chance that I have a, a time machine. Uh, prob prob probably not. The point is, though, you can calculate the probability of what you presume the, the odds are that I have a time machine. And what if you start really low and you're right? Versus what if you start really high and you're wrong? and then no new data comes in. So now you have a bad prior and no way to update it to make your conclusion more accurate. This problem of data disappearing seems to apply specifically to single event historical claims 
that don't have comparable claims, like the origin of the universe. We got one universe we can investigate. We don't get to compare it to any others. There's no data coming in from other universes. And claims about resurrections. The problem with trying to assess the resurrection, as recorded in the Gospels, is there's no new data, and there's been no new data for the entirety of the time that the claim's been around. It is just what the Gospels say. And you can say, oh, there's 21 witnesses. Yes, accounted in those stories. There's also 500 others that never wrote a thing or said a thing that we know of. Maybe if we found one of those, then we would have an ability to actually update our, our priors with new data. But we seem to be stuck with regard to data. Then, uh, kind of, I think incorrectly, suggested that I was making a claim about God, what God would or wouldn't do. I don't think I addressed God or what God would or wouldn't do at any point uh, during the opening, and I don't think it's relevant, because the debate is about whether or not the resurrection is a, a historical event, not how it happened. God is irrelevant to whether or not the resurrection happened, whether or not we have good reason to conclude that a resurrection happened. As a matter of fact, as soon as you add in the also undemonstrated God, you are smuggling in potential bias both to your priors and to what data you're willing to consider. God's existence is irrelevant to whether or not it happened. It may be relevant to how it happened, but that's not what this debate is, and that's not the probability that we're calculating. Did it happen versus how did it happen? Two very different questions. I've done call-in shows for almost, almost 20 years, 19 or so, People call in all the time to tell me all kinds of stories. I've heard about, well, just a week or so ago, this guy had a, a ball of energy pulsing in front of him at the exact moment his dad died and was convinced that that was his dad's soul, that it had traveled how long, how far? 700 kilometers, that was his big point. 700 kilometers was really very, very important. I've had people tell ghost stories, alien abduction stories. What's the probability that people are getting abducted by aliens? And as we go around and listen to the stories and the similarities in the stories, doesn't it become incredibly more likely? What's the probability on an alien abduction that we would have these accounts? Probably pretty high. But that's different from what is the probability on these accounts that alien abductions are actually occurring. The same thing is true for probability with respect to a resurrection. If there is a resurrection, we would expect with a high probability that there would be people claiming that there was a resurrection. There would be people claiming there was an empty tomb, because why on earth would you think that the tomb wasn't empty if you thought that somebody had resurrected? There would be claims that would be consistent with it, because inconsistent claims, as Than demonstrated when he talked about uh, Simon Bar Kokhba, uh, no resurrection claims there, cool. Same's true for everybody that's ever died in my family, but you, you, that doesn't change or alter what sort of data and information we're adding to refine the probabilities. So the odds of evidence or testimony, um, this was, there were a couple of things he mentioned in his opening, and since I'm doing a rebuttal, I'm going to try to hit those. One is that he seemed to suggest, I think, uh, on a slide, I don't know if you said it um, out there, uh, that, that was the, the risk of presenting a testimony of potentially being martyred and killed increases its, its strength, or surprising, I think was the word that you used on, on the slide. Um, and I would agree that that may increase how surprising it is, but it's not in any way relevant to how true it is, because you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. And there have been plenty of people who've been willing to fight and die for things that are bad fight and die for things that aren't potentially true. The, the truth isn't impacted by the number of people believe it, how long they believed it, the strength of their convictions. Our only assessment is about the actual evidence. And while it's neat that they're, uh, neat's probably a bad word, although, uh, who cares? I, I'll say worse at some point. My, I meant to say at the beginning, I'm, I'm not intending to offend anybody, but it's probably gonna happen, so I'm sorry in advance, but I'm actually not that sorry, because I'm just saying what I think and what's the truth, and if that's a problem, that's your problem. Um, but on the issue of the reliability memory, this is something that I addressed uh, specifically with regard to mem memory that might be decades later trying to recall a sermon that you heard. Now, 
the standard apologetic is that God preserved all this and that Jesus, by virtue of being divine, spoke in a way that didn't just resonate with people, but empowered them to remember it and be moved by it. And therefore, we have really good reason to believe that when the Bible says Jesus said this and we put it in red letter, that the person who was writing this down was guided by God and reaffirmed by God, even if they were taking notes off somebody else who wrote as well. But all of that begins with an assumption that there is in fact a God. Once again, we are injecting the bias of a potential explanation for something extraordinary when that explanation hasn't demonstrated that it is possible or true. So what we're doing is multiplying anecdotes. Here's an anecdote, and we're gonna add it to this one, we're gonna multiply it by this one, this one strengthens this one, strengthens this one, and this is why you have this collection of books that is presumed to be guidance on a single narrative. Everything from the creation, our fall, to the redemption. And then we ignore the parts of the story that don't make sense because, well, God's got his reasons, or we'll find out later, or God's ways are not our ways. Well, one of the verses from Romans that I like is, let God be true and every man a liar. Of course, the problem is that verse was written by a man too as was every other verse. So when God shows up to actually say something, I'll listen and I'll try to evaluate whether or not I think God's truthful because that's an assumption as well. The last thing that I'm going to offer a quick rebuttal to in my last minute was a slide, a slide that Than did on uh, Swinburne where basically he structured an argument that Swinburne's case is that uh, God would take the best kind of action and thus taking human form and doing all these things that are attributed to Jesus' life is the best sort of action. Except that none of that has anything to do with a resurrection or the likelihood or the probability of a resurrection, except that you're trying to potentially smuggle a God in as an explanation. But if God would actually do the best thing, wouldn't the best thing be not requiring a torturous blood sacrifice that needs to be accepted based on the worst possible evidence instead of the best possible evidence? Why wouldn't God just forgive people? Why does God have to come down, take human form, sacrifice himself to himself to serve as a loophole for rules that he's behind? I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. Maybe God knows. And that is time. Give it up for both of our debaters. At this moment, as we reset the stage, you have 10 minutes of intermission. At this time, there will be a QR code on the screen. You can go ahead and input your questions online, and those questions will be sent directly to me. If you do not have a question that you want to ask, please still scan the QR code because you are able to vote on the questions that are asked, and I will see which ones have been voted on at the highest and at the lowest ratio. Thank you so much. Is this on? If anybody recorded the opening statements, there was about five minutes of Than's presentation that did not get to go out on stream, and the organizers would love to get a copy from somebody who recorded Than's opening statement so we can splice that in so people can fairly hear what he had to say. If you recorded that five minutes of the opening statement, just pre please meet me right over here to my right. Like the uniqueness of a resurrection, yes. but how do you assess the priors? Or the uniqueness of the Everything. 
Yeah, we could definitely talk about that. But I, I noted the Swinburne thing, and I had already written. I was worried. God's existence is irrelevant. But when you said that I was saying what God. I miss. I must have misunderstood you. Because uh, because right. I want when you when you said we can talk about this in the class. Because yeah. when you said if this was like if this was real, then God should have made it this. Oh. Then what I hear is this is evidence against it. Almost like a hit in this argument. Does that make sense? Yeah. I misinterpreted you. So we can actually, we can go into that, but not without you really getting yeah, yeah. Uh, No, I wasn't, in much the same way that you weren't saying, because you find the New Testament reliable, therefore. Right? Yeah, yeah, I misunderstood I you. wasn't saying, this is what God would have done. I did that at the end yeah. of my rebuttal. Yeah. But I wasn't saying that, I wasn't addressing this until the rebuttal. Yeah, yeah. The swing break. So I think I did in the opening was say, Sort of, it's sort of a question thing of, I, I, I'd have to go back and listen at yeah. this point. Um, but I don't think I, I think I managed to make it to 25 minutes without actually skipping anything. <laughs> I uh, skipped so much. It was so wild because it's like moon landing, Mount St. Helens. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this was the, the part where I was like, flood, arc, survived big fish, people living. Yeah, I was going to say, if you want to actually talk about these, because like I said, I think a Bayesian way of viewing things and updating, I, I think I have a good heuristic for these, because I would agree with you. Full, full, full disclosure, right? Um, I would agree with you, a prima facie reading of those texts and just having those single testimonies is not enough. Yeah, I think that's what we're getting ready to get into, yeah. because I'm, I'm suspecting that your reason for, you know, like if, if this book just dropped down into my lap, yeah. of course we're not gonna get into it. Yeah. But there's other things. Yeah. And I think, I suspect, and we can get into it, that some of the reasons you consider it different are because you're giving priority to things that I can't. Well, that's what's going on. That's part of the base, like, Bayesian like, disputes is you have stuff in your background knowledge that, you can, that I don't have and vice versa. And then the question's just, when we go into this, then there's a heuristic debate element, which is like, what do we set aside? What part of our priors do we set aside? For the sake of conversation, and what do we go off? Of? If that makes sense. Yeah. No, so. I think I can already tell you because I've already said it. So I'm not sure we're gonna do it again. It's for me. Oh, one of your mics is hot. They're hearing everything on my no. stream. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, cool. well,
If anyone has questions, I'm so sorry about my booming voice. If anyone has questions about the Q&A, please come and ask me and I'll be more than happy to assist you if you're having any issues or technical difficulties. Yet again, just a reminder for those who are asking questions, if you have a question for Than, put T dash and then your question. If you have a question for Matt, put M dash and then your question. If you have a question for both, please put B dash and then your question. Put the, put the QR code up, please, again.
All right, if everyone in the main lobby within the sound of my voice, if you can hear me, we are going to be going into our cross-examination. Cross-examination, yet again, it is where they will be able to talk to each other and ask questions with the ability to reclaim time. 10 minutes for Matt and 10 minutes for Than. I'll give you just a moment for everyone to get in here so we can make sure there's not a lot of ruckus. Very quickly, while we're waiting on some Check. people to get in here, uh, if we are still live streaming, for those who are live, this is just one thing. We're only taking questions from the audience because we're going to prioritize those who showed up live. Uh, the only way we will ask questions from the live stream is if uh, we run out of questions, which is very unlikely. So... Secrets. All right. <laughs> we, we were plotting your demise. Matt was just telling me he changed his mind. That was all. So. Oh. Hallelujah. He just stole my joke. I was going to say I changed his mind. We're plotting this year. All right. With that being said, uh, I want to thank the debaters for having a very healthy conversation right now, and we are going to continue that with the same rules that we set in the beginning. Please do not interrupt. Please do not uh, throw verbal tomatoes or physical tomatoes. Thank you so much. With that being said, I'm going to set the timer to 10 minutes, please. All right, Matt, you may begin. So th this is going to be fun because I, I just have a list of questions which I wrote down ahead of time. And even though I wasn't making any claims about God, uh, here's the first question. Why does God need us to assess probability of the resurrection instead of just confirming it? Yeah, so it, it seems like this is an appeal to a divine hiddenness. Correct me if I'm answering and... A little bit, yes. Okay, cool. So there could be a lot of different reasons, right? For instance, God might have good reasons for keeping an epistemic distance away from us. Um, but making things such that we do have to assess probabilities, but the likelihood ratio uh, supports his existence, but not so much that it forces belief. Um, so for instance, I would consider what we're doing here a really valuable thing, right? We're, we're sitting here, and philosophers like to talk about the true, the good, and the beautiful, right? The alethic domains, the moral domains, and the aesthetic domains. Alethic is like truth value, truth finding domains. Now, I, know, I don't know if you're a moral realist or a realist about values or anything. I don't either. Yeah. Um, and so, for, at least for me, my op, like what I'm saying is, coming from that perspective, with that stuff in my background knowledge, it seems like the conjunction of God's existence in some sort of value theory would predict something like God wanting a world where we're sitting here and having these really valuable conversations. That'd be a, a brief overview of sure. what I think. So. Um, was it unfair? Because I, I view this, this thing as particularly unfair, and I've said so before. Why doesn't everybody deserve a Damascus Road experience? Why is Saul picked out uh, to specifically get an interaction that the rest of us don't? Is that to, uh, it sounded like there was, an, there was more comment to that. Sorry. No, no, no. That, that, um, yeah, I it's mean. This, it's I, the same sort of thing, because it sounded to me, and pardon me for, for digging in more, but it sounded to me that you're basically saying, we don't really know why God does this, but he's got his reasons. Mm -hmm. And yet, according to scripture, he violates those for some people and not others. And that to me seems ridiculously unfair. Yeah, so to be clear, I wanna make sure I'm understanding your question. Is this almost like the problem of people who have like access to a miracle account? For instance, like we have, let's just say somebody in here had a religious experience, a Christophany or something like that. And your question is, why do they get it and I don't? Yes. Right. Um, and again, I just seems Which like- I'm not expecting you to have an answer, but that's the point. Yeah, yeah. And so I feel like my answer before that still kind of addresses that. Sure. Um, God might have those types of reasons. And I don't think those reasons are ad hoc. I think they're actually kind of predicted by those, the conjunction of those two things. So for clarity, the- Am I understanding correctly that we don't have extra biblical contemporary accounts that provide any confirmation of the resurrection? Extra biblical? Yeah. Um, 
I don't know that we need it. So, well, that's not what I asked, though. Well, I would say no, we don't, but I don't think okay. we need it yet either, because that, I think the evidence supports what we I'm arguing for on its own. Yeah, I'm. I'm if you don't think we need it, that's fine. I just want to make sure we're on the same page that it's not there, uh, because you know when you look at somebody like uh, the testimony of Flavian is disputed, yeah. but also it wouldn't matter that much to me because it's not like he cites would, sources. So, look, I would consider like that kind of stuff very weak evidence because it's so far removed. And somebody like Josephus is reporting something from all, like so far away, and these are who knows how many hand accounts. Whereas the Gospels are decades different. later. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not terribly interested in what Josephus has to say, at least on that basis, if that makes sense. Is is the intrinsic probability of Jesus' resurrection identical to any other resurrection claim? No. Man, I wish we had another 20 minutes to dig in on that. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, wouldn't the intrinsic probability of a resurrection be the number of true resurrection claims out of the, number, the total number of resurrection claims? Yeah, so uh, this is a really, okay, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> cool. Because now I get the nerd out. I'm um, here to make you happy. Yeah, yeah. So, so. There's multiple ways, and I'm talking to the audience too, because this is really fun. Sorry, I'm just excited. Um, there's multiple ways to assess prior probabilities. One of those things, one of the ways that you can do that is by looking at the frequency of the events that you're looking at, right? But that's not the only way, and it might not even be the best way at all times. Um, there's, I have a counter example. I don't want to take up all your time, but I have a counter example, and I have a um, an, an argument kind of against that. Um, a counter example would be a standard model particle physics predicts that we would have spontaneous proton decay. But the problem is spontaneous bro proton decay um, is in violation of the law of conservation of energy and matter. And so the long story short is um, scientists have for decades tried to measure spontaneous growth to proton decay. have never, ever um, witnessed it or observed it or anything, right? But the thing is the standard model of particle physics predicts it. And we have really good evidence that it does happen. We just never observed it. And so the prior probability if if it's the case that we've never observed um, spontaneous proton decay in science, the prior probability, if we measured it strictly on like a frequentist metric or a frequency metric, would be really low. So there's some pre-theoretic things. I'm going to do you a favor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, trust me, this is me doing you a favor because nobody here cares about <laughs> particle physics. I was asking about the intrinsic probability, not the prior. And so like the intrinsic probability of a resurrection that, that a resurrection has happened is, it would be the number of true resurrections or conf, true resurrection accounts divided by the total number of resurrection claims. The, the intrinsic problem. Right. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm providing a counterexample to the use of frequency for assessing the intrinsic probability. Okay. So and it, depending on how we're using the words intrinsic and prior here, I kind of take those to be inter interchangeable. So maybe you want to. Ooh. Uh, no. So there's the prior probability of a specific resurrection, but the intrinsic probability of resurrections should be however many resurrections happened out of how many resurrections were claimed. It would be a mistake to say how many resurrections out of how many people died. That would not be the probability of a resurrection. Yeah, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems to be a conflation between Bayesian stati like statistic inference and a frequentist statistic inference. Yeah, it's not, this wasn't a Bayesian question, this was about the intrinsic So it's, Okay, so you're asking a frequentist. N oh, not, okay, okay. Yes. That's great. Yeah, so then I would agree with you. If, if I'm a frequentist, but I'm not, um, I would agree with you. But I think there's good reasons to not be a frequentist in this kind of a scenario, okay. um, if you want me to give you that. Remind me when we're done. I, I have a video to send you that I don't completely understand <laughs> that you would love. Um, <laughs> You guys can make fun of me for liking math a bunch. I'm the Greek guy there, that's balding and I got glasses. There, like, <laughs> there's a video out there that I think everybody should probably watch, but it's probably unfair for me to direct you all to it. So go check out my social media at some point, and I will post it there. It's called Craig's Calamitous Cockup, and it is about William Lane Craig's objections to Bart Ehrman's claims when they got into Bayesian probability. But <laughs> this goes through and, and describes the difference between the intrinsic probability and priors and ends up showing that the math, whether you use long form or short form, works out to be essentially the same. And that makes it so that the, the probability of any resurrection 
and the probability of Jesus's resurrection being true are fundamentally identical. It, on both yeah. estimates? Yeah. Yeah, I would just really hard disagree with that. Yep. And Obviously. Maybe we'll go through it sometime. <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to get to it We here can do that on, on, on our own time. I didn't time. bring it. Uh, I doubt people want to listen to us go through long-form this calculus. Is, this is an obnoxious thing that I want to raise just to hear what your answer is. I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not a mythicist. <laughs> I think mythicists are overreaching, a burden of proof that they can't meet. But I have friends who are mythicists, and some of them are well-read and well-written, and one of them being Richard Carrier. I should say Dr. Richard Carrier, just in case, not that it matters. He wrote a book called Proving History that basically argues uh, for using Bayesian analysis to determine um, events from history. It's too much. I did not finish reading it. Sorry, Rick. But he then went on to use Bayesian analysis to assess the historicity of Jesus. And I believe that his conclusion was that there's, I think it's roughly an 80% probability that Jesus never existed. He, he came to about lower than 0.5, I think, is what he argued. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, yeah. So... This is what happens when you don't finish. But his conclusion was that it was at least likely that Jesus never existed. In much the same way that I, oh, well, I'm running out of time. So when I, when I did the, the assessment of Bayesian analysis and I talked about essentially data running out and the uniqueness of events, if, if it turns out that resurrection isn't possible and that perhaps Jesus didn't exist, at least in the way that we recorded, does that change anything about the, the Bayesian analysis that you presented on whether or not the resurrection likely occurred? Yeah. Uh, so if, can I uh, really quickly... Take all the time okay. because I ran out. Really quickly to speak... Yeah, regardless the, of the time, uh, please answer the question. Really quickly to speak on the Richard Carrier thing. Um, I, I read Carrier's book and I like it a lot, actually. The one thing is just, I disagree with, obviously, his inputs. Just like any tool, we can misuse it and come to wrong conclusions, right? Um, scientists try to prove a flat earth by using science, and you think you and I would agree that they're wrong. So, um, remind me of your question again. <laughs> Here's the thought. Does anybody remember the question? Can you say it word for word? Is your memory good enough? <laughs> I got it. <laughs> um, I want to get to your question. All right. I think we hit most of my, my concerns. All right, um, so in my opening statements, I kind of pressed a trilemma, um, which I know a lot of people might not like that type of trilemma because in your experience, you, you've probably run into like the minimal facts type of argument for the resurrection. And I would agree with you that there's other hypotheses you can put up without the reliability of the New Testament. I put up a trilemma, and so with those options, either they were, they were, their claims were true, they were mistaken, or they were lying. Do you think one of those two other theories are more likely than the resurrection? So, I don't, th well, it helps if you actually hold the mic up where <laughs> people can hear you. Um, there's a, whew, I'll try and do this as quickly as yeah, I yeah. can. Generally speaking, um, as a skeptic, my position is to put the burden of proof where it should be. And so, in much the same way that if you walk into a courtroom, the burden of proof is on demonstrating guilt. But failure to demonstrate guilt doesn't mean that you're innocent. And so, when I look at the accounts in the Bible, I am not convinced that they are accurate with respect to what happened, but they may be accurate with respect to uh, what people thought happened. So, for example, when somebody tells me um, they experienced a ghost, I'm happy to believe that they experienced something and that they are perhaps trying to honestly give the best assessment of what it was, but I don't agree with the conclusion that they reached. That's a little problematic, I admit, when it comes to the Gospels, except that I, I view these as stories and I have no way of determining how likely or truthful they are because there isn't independent confirmation outside of it. And since the evidence suggests that they were relying on each other as well, uh, and, and there's some question as to whether or not the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain were the same sermon delivered at different times or the same time and things like that, but I'm fine with there was some sermon in some person. I'm not convinced that I have an accurate representation of what those the people who reportedly wrote this mm -hmm. 
actually thought, because I don't know what's changed. You mentioned that we don't have uh, anonymous originals, but that's because we don't have originals. Sure, but on the condition that we, that we know who the Gospels authors were, we would expect to see the type of evidence that we have, so the likelihood ratio favors traditional authorship given the evidence we have versus not. But this is, this is that difference in methodology, right? Yeah. Because I'm a Bayesian, and so I'm pointing out the logically exhaustive options, and I'm saying conditional on the evidence, uh, conditional on the hypotheses we're testing for versus com given the evidence, we, I'm saying that the likelihood ratio favors the resurrection versus those logically exhaustive options. Now, I'm fine, because if you're just not convinced that the Gospels are reliable, I'm fine asking, I'm fine changing that question to conditional questions, like if the Gospels are reliable, for instance. I don't and, think they're sufficient. Okay, and then that's going to be a difference in methodology yep. still, right? Because, um, for instance, if, would you, let's do, let's, let's do this. Um, Methodology-wise, logically exhaustive options, the most probable, even if it's just point 0.4 for probability, if I final probability, but the rest are like point 0.2, point 0.3, whatever, isn't that, isn't that the most rational thing to do, to believe? No, I'd say the most rational thing, if nothing rises above um, a point 0.5 probability, is to say we don't know what happened. We, we don't have sufficient evidence. So we have the logically exhaustive options and... We have logically exhaustive options, but that doesn't mean that we have sufficient data to determine how those things... Maybe, this is, this is what I was talking about with as the data diminishes, maybe the potential uh, alternate hypotheses, maybe one of them should be a higher pr probability, but we don't have any way to explore it and investigate it. Yeah, we're just going based off what we do know, yeah, right? Based off what we do know, it's like... But isn't that not, is that not what we do in science, for instance? No, because you don't have to reach a conclusion. If, so if you're saying, there's a, there's a famous example about Bayesian analysis. If, uh, if you hear a noise coming from the attic, um, on hearing the noise, the probability of their gremlins in your attic bowling is low. But on the, on the knowledge that gremlins are bowling in your attic, the probability is high that you would hear that noise. In, in a similar fashion, the, if in fact we don't have enough data to be confident that we have adjusted our priors to something that is representative of the totality of experience, then we just don't have enough data to reach a conclusion. And as frustrating as it is, it's not like I'm saying, God doesn't exist, God didn't create the universe, Jesus didn't resurrect, I'm saying I don't have sufficient evidence to do that because what we have are stories and no new data. And the thing that what, frustrates... What well, do you mean by new data? I, that's a, I think that's a really important question. Because sure. you, you mentioned we can't update like today, we have the testimonies, but we can update because we can put in testimony one, testimony two, historical considerations, all that jazz. And then once we run out of the historical data, then I would argue that we can actually do modern day miracle counts, for instance, to update even today. But there's no updating because all of, all of those accounts are from the same sources. Modern-day miracle accounts? Well, Modern-day miracle accounts have no bearing on whether or not Jesus is resurrected. Well, I would, yeah, I would push back on that because, for instance, if you have a miracle account with an associated Christophany and that Christophany predicts, hey, this per like, go reach out to this person and you're going to be prayed for and you'll be healed of cerebral palsy, which you've had for 30-plus years, you're paraplegic, um, you have the brain scans to prove it, all this other stuff. It's biologically impossible to be healed. Um, you get prayed for by that type of per that same person. This is a story of Marlene Kleeps, um, and we can dig into this if you want. Long story short is the religious context of this, because she was healed instantaneously, walked. She scored, I think, 40 points higher in her muscular exams, all this other stuff. She was reviewed by a medical board that, for instance, um, took care of her for the last, I think it was 20 years. I don't remember everything off the top of it, but we can look at the notes if you want. Um, and the long story short is Christophany, religious context, prayed in Jesus' name, and she was healed instantaneously, walking, and today she's still healthy as a uh, normal person, no brain defects, nothing. And it seems to me like if we conditionalize and say, if this is a genuine miracle claim done in Jesus' name, if Jesus is alive today, you would expect to see something like that, where if Jesus was dead today, something like that is drastically unexpected. So we can update the prior still, even today. They're independent accounts. I think it's flawed to presume that 
a miracle done in Jesus' name, even if confirmed, would in any way increase the likelihood that some other miracle account was confirmed. They have to be independent. Well, yeah, of course, we want to have Because some... we have no way of knowing uh, that they're connected. There's well, a presumption I, they're connected. I've established the connection sort of here because, connection like I said... Connection similar beliefs. Well, no, because I'm saying if Jesus rose from the dead and he's still active in the world today, you would expect to see miracles done in Jesus' name with Christ associated Christophanies. I, I don't know that we'd necessarily expect that, but even whether or not Jesus rose from the dead is independent of whether or not there's a God that does miracles. Right, but I'm just conditionalizing here. I'm using conditional probability. So I'm saying if Jesus is, if Jesus is God and he rose from the dead then I would expect to see this. Much like, for instance, if we have transitional fossils and um, we want to say, well, what explains this? Well, if some sort of process like evolution was true, I would expect to see transitional fossils. But the existence of one transitional fossil doesn't tell you about anything at all about the existence of some other transitional form. We could be completely wrong about whales starting as mammals and returning to the sea, and, and whether or not, and the discovery of Tiktaalik doesn't prove anything about any other thing. What it does is it increases um, the probability of a particular model. Of, of the model. Yeah. But you don't have a model, and the model is independent of whether or not Jesus resurrected. I'm talking about whether or not, is it, the, the, the question of the debate was, is it a historical fact that Jesus resurrected? How it happened, whether there's a God, it's completely irrelevant. But even if there's a God that maybe, if there's a God that performs miracles, even in the name of Jesus, that's completely independent from whether or not that God actually raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah, that's kind of the whole point of my argument, though, I feel like, right? We, I'm giving a conditional probability. I'm not assuming God exists. I'm not saying this proves God exists. I'm saying conditional on this hypothesis, I would expect to see these things. Yeah, but now we're back to assuming there's a God that does miracle, we would expect to see these things. But the is that's not the wrong question. The question is, if we see this on someone recovering, on that evidence, what is the probability that this was done by a God? And what is the probability that that's the same God that also happened to resurrect Jesus? Yeah, and I would say it's a lot higher given the religious context and given the now, so here are the options, at least by my lights, when it comes to Ten mir seconds. miracle accounts like this. Um, Give him 20. <laughs> here, here are the options. Um, either it's someone on natural law, um, God did it, some, some sort of divine intervention, or the report was mistaken. In, in the case of Marlene Kleeps, um, I would really discount the mistaken by my medical documentation. And so we're left with those other two options, most likely, which is some unknown natural law or divine inter intervention. Um, if we do some unknown natural law, I think that would actually undermine all the way, every, like, a lot of the stuff that we know about science. Because if there's some unknown natural law that can do something that's we, that we've deemed biologically impossible, then what do we actually know about the natural laws that we do know today? Not much, which is why there are all sorts of things that get claimed to be miracles on a regular basis. Remission is claimed by a, to be a miracle from almost everybody who has a theistic view of miracles, and yet the scientific explanation is we don't know. Yeah, and I'm saying the theistic explanation is. That's going to be time after okay. his answer. All right. We are going to move into the final portion, and Matt, you can go ahead and do your five-minute closing. Oh, I gotta find glasses for that. Where are they? 459, 458. <laughs> <laughs> I only need three minutes. All right. So, one of the things, first of all, thank you all again. This has been great, and thank you, Than. I, like, we should go have a lot more conversations. Heck yeah. Um, I'm an advocate for trying to have consistent standards when we're evaluating claims. Because if we have inconsistent standards, we're likely to believe things and discount things, independent of whether they're actually true. That's how we try and avoid biases. This is the reason why scientific skepticism, or the modern view of skepticism, is very, 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 very much not cynicism. I can't stress that enough. We landed on the moon. There are people who doubt it. It's 
I, I don't think you can know anything to an absolute certainty, but it's way up there. Cynics and conspiracy theorists are the ones who have a flawed epistemology that allow them to inject biases and fears to compound ignorance and say, I don't believe that happened. Skepticism is about saying, I'm not going to believe something happened until there's good evidentiary warrant for it. And it is gaining comfort with being able to say, I don't know. And as uncomfortable as we all are with not knowing, sometimes, most times, that's the right answer. Throughout the entirety of human history, the only answer that many people had for most things was, I don't know. And then we developed the processes to go out and explore. The best standards of evidence encourage doubt. They don't discourage doubt and suggest that you'll be blessed for not exercising doubt. Because the truth has nothing to fear from doubt. And the truth has nothing to fear from inquiry. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, I remain unconvinced. We need to do more to convince me. Skepticism is not just about rejecting claims. I'm not saying the resurrection didn't happen. I'm saying it probably didn't happen based on the reasons that I already presented. I'm not saying miracles didn't occur. I'm not saying there's not a God. I'm saying that my assessment, and really this isn't completely accurate, is that they probably didn't happen. But mostly I'm saying, I don't know yet. But I'm completely unconvinced. And this is coming from someone who walked down the aisle at the age of five, at a revival, at Gashland Baptist Church in Kansas City. I was very active in the church. I'm not gonna claim that I was super Christian or anything, but I was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night youth groups, Saturday visitation, or Monday night visitation, Saturday youth missions and things like that. But I also did stuff that um, I had sex uh, before <laughs> marriage, and, uh, and I drank alcohol when I was underage. All things that my parents would frown on and the church would frown on, so I wasn't super Christian at all. But the thing about skepticism is that, much like a Bayesian analysis, it's subject to revision based on new information. That's what science is. Science doesn't make proclamations of truth. Science creates models that are the best representation or the best explanation for the facts that we have. And when new facts come along, science revises. And what I hear from some people, although I would bet every dollar in my pocket you'd never hear it from Than, which is one of the reasons we're gonna get along. But what I hear from some people is, gosh, Science is always changing. They keep coming up with new stuff. They don't, can't make up their mind. They used to think this, and now they think this. I'm just going to stick with the gospel because that was the truth from the start and remains the truth all the way up to this day and will be forever the truth. No. It's a strength of science that it revises its positions based on new evidence, and it is a weakness of dogma that it doesn't. And for the people who think, well, Matt's just too skeptical, he's bordering on cynical, no evidence seconds. would convince him. When people ask, what would change your mind about God, I've given the same answer for probably 10 or 12 years now. I used to give glib answers, but now my answer is this. I don't know what would change my mind about God. It would be arrogant of me to presume that I could tell the difference between God and some advanced technology or some mistake or some delusion. But if there is a God, God absolutely should know what would change my mind and has not done it, which means either he doesn't exist or he doesn't want me to know he exists. Either way, it's not my problem. Put five minutes on the timer. All right, Than, you can begin your closing statement so, when you're ready. Yeah, I want to start off by just saying, I actually, like, I love this debate, by the way. Like, this was super fun, because, Matt, you and I agree on a lot of stuff. We, we like, we disagree One on One sec, hold your applause. <laughs> Give me that time back. <laughs> just kidding. Um, we agree on a lot of stuff. Um, I agree with you. Science updating as new evidence comes awesome. Um, I'm all for science. You and I probably would upset more people than we 
than you, than the people that we actually that agree with us. Um, I'll just keep it at that. So, and, and I also and we also have a mutual friend. So we suspected this was probably going to happen. Yes, <laughs> J Mike for anybody that knows who that is. Um, and I love that. And uh, what you talked about with science is one of the reasons why I think Bayesian analysis is so useful too. Um, it, there's tons of papers that I could allude to right now and tons of modern research that I could allude to right now, but like Bayesian analysis is the, is the way of the future right now. Um, we actually even have psychological studies that are newer, about 2022, that have like proven pretty much that the way our brain is mapped is to think in Bayesian analysis. Um, so I think this mixture of science with Bayesian analysis kind of like, I almost want, like you're so close <laughs> to the Bay. Forget about the gospel for a second. Just I want to indoctrinate you into the base, <laughs> uh, and I'm just super excited about that. Um, putting all that aside, <laughs> um, I'm I'm just super thankful for this discussion. Um, and for anybody that's listening here, thinking, what should I believe? Um, I think what your answer to that question might come down to: what is the right methodology to use when I'm asking this question? Am I using and, and I know you guys probably learned a lot about probability theory and stuff like that here, but am I using a frequentist metric where I'm measuring the frequency of events to determine the probability? Or am I gonna use some kind of a Bayesian metric that allows for all these variables in pre-theoretical conditions, in conditional probabilities? This type of methodology that modern science uses, modern historians are starting to recognize that we should be using, and that our, our brains are predetermined to think in that, in that fashion. Um, and I'm going to leave you guys up to decide what happened there. Um, last thing I wanted to say is, um, for those of you that came here hoping for a bloodbath, because I know a lot of people were, I'm not kidding. I had a lot of people, I have a, I'm not very well known um, compared to Matt, but I've had a lot of people that came up to me and just think, like, oh, you got to destroy that guy. And I'm like, for those of you that wanted that, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'd rather have this mutual, loving, pursuit of truth that Matt and I had here today over one of us trying to destroy each other and getting into rhetoric battles that you guys don't get anything out of other than I, I said some whammies and he said some whammies and we just tried to make look each, each other look bad. I'm really thankful for that. And thank you to everybody that helped me prepare. Thank you for my friends that came out here to watch me today. Um, for your support. I want to say thank you to, to a lot of um, other Christians that helped me, whether they're scholars like Tim, Dr. Tim Lydia McGrew, Dr. Luke Vandeway, um, I, uh, Ryan Mullins, Perry Hendricks, uh, other Christian content creators like Christian Idealism, um, Invoking Theism, yeah, and tons of other people. Uh, for anybody that wants to know stuff about like modern miracles, that can Marlene Clay Cleves case I brought up, for instance, in an upcoming book from one of my friends, Caleb Jackson, um, I think it's called Proving Prayer or something like that. Um, he talks about that case in there, and he goes through deep methodological criteria on these types of things. So there's tons of resources on these things. Um, and just again, thank you, Matt. I really loved this conversation. I you the rest of my time is go get it back. Thank you. All right. So now you may applause. <laughs> So before we move into the Q&A, a lot of people, as I've been the primary promoter, um, if you've seen me, and it's because I joined an atheist Facebook page, <laughs> do you know how many times I had to lie to get in? <laughs> and how many times I had to repent after? No, Lord. No, but I want to thank everyone for coming out. People were asking me, why are you doing a debate? This was why, exactly what Than just uh, gave in his sentiments, is we wanted to promote a conversation that was not an echo chamber, a one where there are two different viewpoints, there are two different worldviews that are represented, but they're able to have a conversation, they're able to do it in love, and they're able to do it in respect, and that is what we are about. So I want to thank both debaters. Give them one more round of applause. And with that being said, we are going to move into Q&A, um, set the timer for 20 minutes. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Most of those will probably the be for me. The lights come down. <laughs>
Can I phone a friend? We are going to put the QR code up one more time to give you one final chance. This QR code is going to be used yet again for two things. You can either ask a question or you can vote on questions. Please put T dash, then the question if the question is for Than. Please put M dash, then your question if the question is for Matt. And then finally, if you want to ask both of them a question, put B dash and then ask your question. But the first question I'm going to go with is the one with the most votes, and this is a question for Than, and I'm gonna try to, the best of my ability, uh, give, yeah. uh, <laughs> give questions to both debaters. So, Than, how do you determine that the Bible is any more true than any other book out there? Many books are written down, but we don't believe they are historically accurate. How long do I have to answer that question? 18 minutes and 55 seconds. All right, you guys ready for a lot? No, I'm not gonna do that, don't worry. Um, I'll just kind of give a short burst for that answer because it's, it's really deep. Um, I think Matt and I, you, you would agree too. I don't, there's, there's a certain type of apologetic a lot of Christians will use to answer that type of question and it'll be like presuppositionalism. And I, I can't speak for Matt, but I really disagree with that approach. Um, I don't think you can presuppose these things. I think these things have to, I'm a, I'm a staunch evidentialist. I think you should follow the evidence where it leads. And so I think that there's good reasons to think things like the Bible is ins the inspired word of God. Um, and I do think there's good reasons to inductively go from, for instance, the resurrection of Jesus to the inspiration of scripture. Um, and I think there's good reasons to think that other pieces of scripture like the Quran um, are not the dictated or, well, for, it depends on what you think about the Quran. Some Muslims will think, for instance, that it was dictated. Some Muslims think that it was handed down by the angel group Gabriel to the Prophet Muhammad. Christians don't think that. Christians think that there was some sort of cooperation on God's behalf uh, with his people to dynamically write the scriptures. And so I think there's good reasons to think that. Um, I don't know if I can get into that all that right now, but that would be a short answer of how I view things. All right. We're then, in agreement. Presuppositionalist apologetics is bad. Yeah. So is the Quran. We're in agreement. <laughs> we just disagree on the Bible stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question, this is going to be for Matt. Matt mentioned he was agnostic on whether or not a resurrection was possible. Can you explain why one should believe that a resurrection is possible? Oh, uh, I think I think they might have meant is not possible. Or no, they probably asked what what would what criteria would I use to determine that a resurrection is possible? I think is what they're asking. Uh, yeah. I hope so. Um, also, I'd bet money I didn't use the term agnostic, but I did that the other day, and I was wrong about whether or not I said a particular word. So my apologies to that caller here live on the debate. Um, the de so the, for the demonstration for the possibility of a resurrection is no different from the demonstration of the possibility of anything else, and that is a confirmed resurrection. Once we have a confirmed resurrection that we have you know, verified this, this individual is dead in this way. Now, we live in, in, in the modern world. I had triple bypass just a couple of years ago, uh, so I've been dead. Uh, all right, maybe not, but they... <laughs> They did cut me open. I have pictures of my heart. It's on my fridge. Um, I was the first person who ever asked for pictures of my heart. And I, I was like, how in the world has nobody ever asked for this before? I mean, this is the coolest thing. You're going to crack my chest open and rip a vein out of my leg. And but anyway, that's it's a completely different story that doesn't belong here. The point is, we know a heart, trans or a heart repair is possible because it's been demonstrated to be possible. And after that, we can then assess how, what the likelihood of survival is. My odds for survival were incredibly high, and we know that because there's been a lot of them. But we know it was possible because it had been done. So once we have scientific confirmation of a particular type of returning from the dead, I then would consider that possible. We already have confirmation of some sorts of returning from some things that we would consider dead, but what that's done is it's revised our definitions of what death is and, and viewed it more of as a process. 
where you're not dead until you're either cold and dead or warm and dead, depending on how you started off, I, either of those may be the case. But that, it, it's a demonstration of an actual, you have somebody die, confirm that they're dead, stick them in a tomb for three days, and then they walk out with nobody else doing anything else, now you've confirmed that that's at least possible. All right. The next question is going to be for Than. Get it open. <laughs> Than, the Romans are famed for their records. Do you have any primary sources you can reference besides the Bible as a source? I'm assuming that's for like for the resurrection or I believe I believe so, yeah. I think it's a repeat of a question I asked you. Yeah, yeah. So um, th this is a really important question because you kind of see this a lot in New Testament scholarship. Um, like I said, I think the, gospel, the New Testament is a highly historically reliable document. I gave arguments for that. Asking for something, like assuming you're asking uh, like Roman evidence for the resurrection I, or non-Christian evidence for the resurrection, I don't know that you would actually expect that. Why would I expect somebody that didn't see Jesus rise from the dead or didn't believe Jesus rose from the dead to see something like that. The, the other part of this is in New Testament scholarship, a, a big mistake that I think scholars make is something called an argument from silence. I think our intuitions about what people in the past would or would not write about are, are deeply flawed. Um, so for instance, you might expect pe um, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, everybody to be writing about it, yet 8,000 miles away from it, I mean 8,000, uh, not 8,000 miles away, long story short is, I forget the guy who wrote it, but basically there's the guy who wrote about the eruptions um, about Vesuvius a few years later, he fails to mention it. And other instances could be even just more modern. Um, so for instance, we have in, was it the, forget which war it was, and with Napoleon, off the top of my head, I can't remember. The basic idea is um, there's certain events in history that you would expect people to write about because of their significance, yet they don't say anything about them. Um, I have a video on this, on the, but I just don't remember all the stuff off the top of my head. The basic idea, though, is I've outlined about 13 examples of major events throughout history, and you see these major events, and people that should have writ written about them don't. And so I think our intuitions about who would and wouldn't write about these things can be deeply flawed. Is it cheating for me to dive in with a no, side question? Please. This can just be yes or no, because I'm not trying to derail it. The graves opening up and the saints marching into Jerusalem to appear to people, nobody seems to have written about that other than the author of Matthew. Yeah. Is that within your expectation that people wouldn't write about that? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So I don't know. I, like, I, really, I just don't have an answer to that. There wasn't a lot of writing, so maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Like I said, at the end of the day, I, I'm just being honest. Mm. Um, now, do what I consider that evidence against it? I'm not sure, because I think the intentions of the auth other authors could be different than what Matthew's trying to do. Um, I just don't know. I think at best it's weak evidence, but I think that it was a historical event, and I would support that inductively through the resurrection of Jesus arguments for the inspiration of scripture um, and the reliability of the Bible. Thanks. All right, the next question is for Matt. Matt, how do you explain prophecy in the Old Testament? A source that aligns with various confirmed historical events, places, people, etc., that was revealed by Jesus' actions in the New Testament. <laughs> wow, that's a small question. So if you go search on the website, you'll find places, so websites that are like 713 prophecies. Um, the thing is, I, the sorts of things that are prophecies, in order for something to count as a prophecy, it needs to be specific, answerable by a single set of circumstances without interpretation, and has to actually be done beforehand and come true. I would need to evaluate the specific prophecy claims because what some people consider prophecy is a vague thing in Isaiah that they say ref is reflected in Jesus. But if I order a medium rare steak and the waiter brings me a medium rare steak, he's not fulfilling prophecy. 
He's doing what I asked. And so in some cases, when you have people sitting around waiting for a Messiah, they're going to be working towards that goal, just like we have people potentially working towards the goal in Israel, without getting into any of the politics, um, on, with regard to end-time prophecies. It's not a prophetic, a fulfillment of prophecy if people are actively working to do it. If I predict that in, in a year someone's going to name their baby Fergal, Burgal, Minergal, Burgal, don't you do it. <laughs> and somebody does it, that's not fulfilled prophecy. Now, I'm a magician, uh, and I can, I can pretend to read minds with the best of them. I can blow your mind with a rubber band, or I can make a prediction and, and demonstrate that I, seemingly I can control your behavior or dictate what's going to happen in the future, but it's done with trickery. Is that what I think is happening with the Bible? Probably not. I don't fall into the Jesus was a wizard or magician uh, <laughs> mindset, but there are problems related to some of the prophecies that Christians want to identify, and to find out what those problems are, you should go talk to the Jews, because it's their Messiah, and they're not convinced. All right, Than, if every copy of every Bible in the world were to disappear, what proof, quote-unquote, would you try to use to prove the resurrection occurred? <laughs> so... Um... I'll, to prove the resurrection occurred. Well, one, I don't think we can prove it right now, because if by prove you mean 100% certainty or it's logically entailed by something, um, I don't think you can do that, if that's what you're really asking for. Now, if you're just asking, like, what sort of evidence would we have if there was no Bible, that would mean that we have no Gospels um, or New Testament in general, and then I would just say we don't have evidence for the resurrection, at least that's strong enough to overcome um, the prior probability that I would assign to the resurrection of Jesus. All right. This is going to be a question for Matt. With many people having been declared dead, sometimes for extended periods, there are well-documented events of what could be viewed as resurrection. How are these examples not relevant? Many people were claimed dead, and can you say that again? I just archived it after I asked the question. <laughs> I think he, okay, let me try. I'm so sorry. Let me try to rephrase it. Yeah, try to I rephrase I think he's it. asking, there's two options here. Either he's asking about people that have been claimed dead and then were revived, or they're asking about maybe modern day resurrection accounts. Um, like for instance, I think I remember you had a conversation with a friend of mine and we got a guy like Daniel Kikachu. Um, who was claimed to be resurrected from the dead. Oh, gosh, I can't believe you just mentioned that name. No, no, you're, I, no, no, you're not, no I can understand where you're going from. No, there is the, the African guy that got ro rose from the dead. Not Hikikachu, not the Muslim guy. I, I apologize, I, I'm genuinely lost. I'm not oh. sure what the purpose of the question is. All right, we're just going to move on to the okay. next question. <laughs> well... Is the person in here who asked the question? Because just hit me up afterwards and I'll do my best. But I think this may relate to why I was saying that uh, the MS miracle account doesn't add credence to the Jesus resurrection. And so if other people were proclaimed dead and came back from the dead, each case is independent. It doesn't prove that some other case happened. Whether or not... If we could demonstrate why they happened, and we could confirm that it happened, it might increase our, un, uh, our accuracy on the explanation for why it happened. But the fact that it happened doesn't increase the likelihood that any other, uh, well, it may increase the likelihood, but it does not confirm that any other claimed resurrection actually happened. And since the only thing we were debating today was, is the resurrection a historical event, um, other Claimed resurrections are irrelevant as to whether this is. Um, and the explanations for how or why they occur is similarly irrelevant. By the way, Shannon's really mad at you. Why? I'll tell you later. <laughs> the MS miracle. Oh, okay. All right. For Than, why should we rate the probability of resurrection of Jesus higher than the resurrection of other gods? Osiris, Tammuz, Adonis. Zagreus, Dionysius. 
Yeah, I have uh, an hour-long video on this, um, and off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact details, but um, I can tell you with a high amount of confidence that none of those are actually physical resurrections. They're assumptions into those mythic heavens or whatever it might be. Um, the other side of the coin is that the other side of the coin is that um, these are just singular accounts. We don't have multiple eyewitness testimonies with polymodal experiences. Um, and the, t like the type of case that you'd have to build for those is not equal to the case that I've provided for the resurrection. And so I would say prior probability of some type of bodily assumption like that is not that high. And I don't think that the likelihood ratio is strong enough given the small amount of evidence we have with those types of gods. Matt, what are your thoughts regarding the evidence that there was a significant transformation of the disciples from fearful and delusion followers to bold proclaimers of Jesus' resurrection? Well, I don't know that it actually happened. Um, it's not surprising to me that, you know, that would be included in the story. Um, but at no point has there been any demonstration of a transformative experience that necessarily requires the existence of a God as opposed to belief about the existence of a God. When people say, oh, I was a terrible alcoholic and God delivered me from alcohol. How do you know that God delivered you from alcohol? What about all the alcoholics that found other ways? When we have things like 12-step programs and the first step is admitting that you are powerless, I find those programs to be incredibly manipulative. And what they, what they actually do is to try to give you the power externally like Dumbo's magic feather. How do you know it's the feather that's doing it? How do you know that God's doing it? So it's not surprising to me that people have had transformative experiences after coming to believe things, whether they come to believe what your denomination believes or some other Christian denomination believes or what Islam teaches. There's no denying. I have former atheist acquaintances who are now Muslims, their lives have been transformed, and most of them would say that it was transformed for the better. I think they're wrong, but the transformative nature of a belief and experience is also independent from whether or not that belief and experience is true. It may be, it may not be, but you'd have to demonstrate it independent of just the experience. Than. When determining probability of the resurrection, what specific numerical values do you input as your numerator and denominator to determine your conclusions? <laughs> Get yeah. your calculators out, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for the math portion. Yeah, so if you evening. see, if you actually put a point... No, I'm just kidding. So um, <laughs> Matt and I talked about this when we had lunch yesterday. Um, when you're actually doing a Bayesian analysis, um, there's different types of probabilities you can work with. There's like statistical probabilities, right? Um, and then there's things called epistemic probabilities. Those are going to be like degrees of support from one data point to the hypothesis. And you don't have to assign hard numbers. If you do, there are going to be idealizations of more epistemic ranges more than anything else. So for instance, I might say the likelihood ratio of the evidence given hypothesis is low, medium, sh medium, high, whatever you, whatever you might say. And if I say like for instance it's high, if you ask me to quantify that, I can say 0.8 or 0.9 is, an, is a near approximate idealization of that number. But the nice thing about Bayes is what we're going to do when we do those approximations is we're going to go with the most conservative numbers. So if I think it's high, I'm going to go with the lowest number that could be high. And then from there, I can actually even back solve to the lowest prior um, possible to demonstrate like, what the prior probability needs to be to overcome those things too. So. Um, I don't assign hard numbers to any of these things. I just use those epistemic ranges. If you want to use hard numbers, that's how you do it. Um, yeah. All right, Matt. And uh, we're going to do rapid, rapid fire because I do want to get at least, uh, we have so many questions, we are not going to be able to ask them all within the time frame. I'll be brief. So you guys I, don't believe I that, apologize. Do <laughs> I'm, uh, so Matt, your question is, you said that for some state of affairs to be empirically possible, it needs to be verified. Do you recognize that empirical possibility is not the type of possibility Than's argument is using? I'm not completely convinced that Than's not talking about empirical possibility, but I, 
I don't know how else to phrase this other than I genuinely don't care if something is merely logically possible because logical possibility is it's just simply the default until you prove that it's not possible and for unfalsifiable things that will never happen. All right, this is a question for both. And I'm going to ask two final questions. If we agree there are many contradictions in the Bible, then why is it being used as evidence? If there is 100% contradictions, then the probability of the historicity being accurate is zero. Okay, so I'm also going to do Than a favor because he's a nice guy. Yeah, I don't buy that question at all. Uh, first of all, I, I'm fine with the notion that there are potential con contradictions in Scripture, but the fact that a contradiction exists doesn't mean that it's 100% contradictory in everything that it says, and uh, that doesn't mean that the odds of some, of some other claim uh, being true go to zero. Uh, in the same way that I'm consistent in saying that Resurrection A doesn't tell you anything about Resurrection B, and miraculous, seemingly miraculous cure of X doesn't tell you anything about this, a flaw or fallacy or contradiction in the Bible in part A doesn't tell you anything at all about the likelihood of a claim in part B. Spider-Man may not exist, but New York does. Yeah, so Matt said a lot of good things there. Um, and I would, as just adding on to that, I would just kind of question the assumption in the question um, that there is 100% contradiction um, I'm open to there being a contra contradictions in the Bible, contrary to what many Christians might want to say. I'm open to that idea. I've just yet to see a contradiction that is actually a true contradiction. I think there's some good candidates where I think the likelihood is just kind of like barely favoring the harmonization or whatever. Um, but I'm open to it. It's just the, qu the assumption in the question I think is questionable. And the final question is for both. If by your own admission that the power of the resurrection lies within God and not man, then how can one claim God's existence is not relevant to the resurrection? That doesn't sound like both. Um, I can play. I, I saw the I B. A, I, I saw the B, ego. and I was I was thrown. Do you want me to do alter ego? So if y'all if y'all do want to uh, tackle that question, you can uh, attack it from the other one one more time side of it because. I think I'm going to rip this one. So yeah, this is going to be for Matt, but then uh, Than, I'll just give you a response to this as well on how um, God's existence is relevant. Right. If so by the your question own is, if God's the only one that can do a resurrection, then how could God's existence not be relevant to the resurrection? To the topic, yes. Yeah. Who said God's the only one that can do a resurrection? The point of tonight's debate was, is the, is the resurrection a historical event? I never addressed whether or not God did it or could did it. I don't need to come up with an explanation for how it could happen until such time as I have good reason to think it did happen. And I may still answer with, I don't know, yep, it's historically likely that Jesus was resurrected, but I don't know how it happened. But it's still not relevant to whether or not it did happen. If I'm the one that does a magic trick that doesn't tell you, just because you saw it happened, how I did it. And I can make it look like somebody else did a magic trick. If I get a little kid up on stage and have him do the magic, who's doing the magic, the little kid or me? The only question was, did a magic trick occur historically? My, no, I'm not going to apologize for calling it a magic trick. It's magic. And I'm not convinced that a magic trick happened. So I don't need to explain it. All right, and Than, I'll let you answer the same question from the opposite view, and then that will be the end of our debate. Uh, is God's existence relevant to the resurrection? If so, why? Uh, yeah, I would say whether or not God exists is relevant to the resurrection. Um, I would agree with Matt that it's possible that some other non-God creature or agent or whatever you want to say could do a, a resurrection. Maybe there's some sort of non-perfect being out there that wants to do that. That's within the realm of logical or metaphysical possibility. Um, but I think what's relevant here is, I think, for instance, that a, priori, that a priori argument I put up for why God might become incarnate and all these other things and what that God incarnate might look like. 
And so I think there's tons of contextual and theoretical things going on here that are relevant because if God or gods, like little g gods, don't exist, then I would say that is relevant to whether or not a resurrection can happen because I would say resurrections can't happen biologically speaking. Just, that's not how natural laws work. And so something other than the natural laws has to impede on those. And that's, what I'm, that's why I think it's relevant. I don't think we know natural laws well enough yet. But we can save that for round two. Yeah. We want to thank you, Than, so much for being here. Matt, thank you so much for being here. John, thanks for organizing this and moderating it. Um, I want to thank you, the audience, for coming tonight and for your participation and for uh, being respectful of both men and both uh, sides of this discussion. Thank you so much. And I do want to recognize, if you came from out of state, somebody came from Washington State for this debate here in Tampa, Florida. If you came from out of state, would you just stand up for a second because you deserve a, a hand clap. Wow. Yeah, those, some those are all fans' friends. My friends don't travel this far. <laughs> They're all at the NCAA tournament. No, <laughs> not all of them They're are Christians. They're all at the American Atheist National <laughs> Convention. Oh, that's going on now. Oh, sorry. It's Easter weekend every every year, or almost every year, because so, people have that weekend off. So we just celebrate two different things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're celebrating my birthday on Sunday. <laughs> and happy birthday to you. Thank you, Matt, for coming and being with us. Um, I just want to close up by saying this one last thing. Uh, we've heard a debate about the resurrection tonight. Guess what? This has been going on for over 2,000 years. In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul, who had persecuted Christians, who became a Christian, stood up in Athens and gave a defense of the resurrection. And listen to what was said. According to Acts, it says, um, the writer was Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And uh, some even actually believed. And so I just want to give you an invitation as the pastor here. I am going to preach a very biased resurrection message Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. You're more than welcome to come if you're one of those who would like to hear more. If you're one of those that maybe we're convinced, or maybe you're already convinced, I am convinced. I'm going to stay with my position as much as I appreciate Matt, and I enjoyed listening to him. But my heart is that if you want to hear that, you're more than welcome to come. This church doors are open to you if you'd like to attend. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you have a wonderful evening. God bless you all.